All right, today's teaching will be on the history of Bible believers. And I think the best place to start is where Jesus gave the command to the early church. The early church back then, Jesus Christ told them, at, uh, and the command at Matthew chapter 28, that they are to go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the church is supposed to spread throughout the entire world and let them know about the glorious Savior who died, buried, and resurrected for all of mankind. The early church, as they started out, they were going under severe persecution. It didn't seem like that it would be a mighty church. Satan immediately attacked the church. As our Bible-believing history began, Satan, he always starts out by attacking you, by attacking the Bible-believing work. He didn't want them to succeed. The early Christians, if you know your Bible at the book of Acts, the Bible talks about the early Christians how they were first called Christians, first called Christians, was where the Bible says in the city of Antioch. Antioch, that's where the disciples were first called Christians. So when you go back to Antioch, then you would know, oh, that's where the good guys are at. That's where the good guys are at. That's where the manuscripts, the words of God, would be properly written and be at. Amen. So then, some of the people were wondering, well then, if that's where the Word of God is, then shouldn't we go by the manuscripts of that time period? You're absolutely right, actually. So you're absolutely right that the manuscripts we should go by are in Antioch, no other area. That's where the disciples were first called Christians, and that's where the Lord laid out His scriptures. Christians were heavily persecuted and tortured. There was no mercy as the devil began to attack them. So much blood was poured out from Christians that it was horrendous that time. So many Christians were getting killed and persecuted. As a matter of fact, lions wouldn't eat any more Christians because the there were just too many Christians being eaten up and torn apart by lions. There are too many Christians being killed that there were officials and government leaders telling the emperor and their leaders that they were sick and tired of seeing more Christians being killed. They even shed a little pity on them. Why? Because there were just too many Christians being killed. Diocletian, in fact, he was so infamous for killing thousands of Christians that one time he cried out, the name of Christian is extinguished. But instead, Christianity increased even more. The devil couldn't stop that one. Men, when they were being crucified on, Christ, uh, on crosses, the men, they rejoiced that I'm just dying the same way as my Lord and Savior died. The Romans thought they were doing it out of mockery, but instead they just encouraged the Christians even more. There were old men and little children who were burned at the stake while singing hymns for Jesus Christ. Women being torn apart by lions while they were holding their hands together to pray and praising the Lord. It was unthinkable. The persecution could not be stopped. In fact, the 12 apostles, nearly all of them, we could say, were martyred or suffered some form of persecution during the early days, during the days of Rome. Most of the 12 apostles, according to, to tradition, they died as martyrs and they would uh, be killed by either being crucified or murdered by pagans. Why? You know why they were killed by some of the pagans? Because they would, some of them would be fanatical enough to street preach in front of their idolatrous feasts. <laughs> and then they would get so mad that they would kill these apostles. So this is nothing new in Christianity. If uh, the main leaders of the early church, our forefathers died that way, then we're following the right example. There was another person who died for the Lord Jesus Christ, Polycarp. He was an early Christian leader that time. And Polycarp, he was told that he would be released if he would deny Jesus Christ. But Polycarp, when he was told that, he replied back instead, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? So they burned him at the stake. However, he was still alive. He didn't die. So one of the people got so angry that he wouldn't die 
that they thrust him with the spear. And when they thrust him with the spear so that they can kill him, instead the blood gushed out that doused the fire. So they had to light a second fire on top of that to finally finish the job. And that's an 86-year-old man who laid down his life for Jesus Christ compared to today's Christians who don't have enough of a guts to stand for Jesus Christ, right? Ignatius was another early Christian leader who took care of the early churches after the Apostle Peter died. Polycarp took care after the Apostle John died. Ignatius did it for the Apostle Peter. And Ignatius, when he was arrested and condemned to be executed and torn apart by the lions, he begged the Christians who told him, we're going to come and rescue you. And Ignatius begged the Christians, please don't rescue me. Why? Because he wanted to die for Jesus Christ. Amen. He was so impatient that as the lions came to him, he egged on the lions. And he egged on the lions. And opening up his arms, he cried out, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found pure bread. And that's what he replied, and then the lions came and then tore him to shreds, but he just embraced the lions and died for Jesus Christ. Tertullian was perhaps one of the best Christians of that time, and Tertullian, as he was undergoing and witnessed all the persecutions that his fellow Christians went through, the, the emperors were baffled by Christians constantly increasing. They would not stop. They kept on growing. And, Tertu and the emperor was so baffled and confused, and he wondered, and Roman leaders, Roman emperors and Caesars, wondered, why does Christianity keep on growing no matter how much we try to stamp it out? And Tertullian, he answered their questions through his writing. And his answer was this, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that's why Christianity continued to grow. So the devil knew that he couldn't stop the early church through persecution. So then what he had to do to stop the early church was through heresy. And that has always worked. What has always worked, even today, was heresy. Why? Because you get onlineers today who might be, yeah, we'll go through persecution, lay down our life, but they don't care about heresy. And they get deceived by heresy, onlineers and people today in our church, right? They get so many, de they get s deceived by false doctrines from the wrong churches, and they get deceived uh, by online stuff, even though they said they're willing to undergo persecution for the Lord. And that has always worked throughout history, and that's what the devil used. Uh, the devil, how he used were these two places, Alexandria and Rome. These were the two most demonic places ever in our church history. And whenever you hear these two names, you've got to realize they're capital enemy number one. They're not your best friend. All right? They're capital enemy number one. They're not your best friend. It's always been here that there's always been a problem, that the devil always rooted out evil. And let's start out with philosophy, shall we? Philosophy. Plato and Aristotle. The granddaddies of philosophy. And philosophy, it was so seeped within Greece that it affected and reached Alexandria. So because it affected and reached Alexandria, Egypt, there was so much philosophy mingled with any of the Christian churches that were successfully planted within the African region. So as Christian churches were being successfully planted in the African region, philosophy was already seeded in there. And then so you get some guy like R.C. Sproul, excuse me, Plato and Aristotle, who combined philosophy with theology and religion and successfully created the corruption. So they laughed, the philosophers laughed about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul, he actually preached to some of these famous philosophers that came after Plato and Aristotle. But they laughed at Paul. They laughed about the resurrection of Christ. They didn't believe in that. They prioritized human wisdom, and they prioritized questioning the Word of God. Those are two salient things you want to understand about these guys. And that will come in very importantly later on in history. They prioritized human wi wisdom, and they prioritized questioning the Word of God. 
So then they thought they were smart enough to make their own Bible. Yep. So then they made their own manuscripts. And thus came the Alexandrian manuscripts yep. in competition against the Antioch manuscripts. So then now the devil had his own Bible being formed, competing against each other. But these were supposedly the higher educated people. The philosophical thinking is undoubtedly originating from Plato and Aristotle. There's no doubt about it. Even textual critics will admit that, that the Alexandrian scholars who corrected uh, your Bible, they were embedded with already philosophical thinking from Plato and Aristotle and the Grecians. They would take manuscripts, they would take manuscripts from Antioch, and they would deliberately, I kid you not, they deliberately cut off verses from the Bible. And the proof is when you look at the Sinaiticus that, uh, manuscript, when you look at Sinaiticus, there's an entire column that's deliberately cut off with a blade that you can notice, like it's a penknife. And that's the reason why, no wonder Mark 16 only has, what, one or two or a couple verses, that's it? Right. Why? They chopped off a whole column. Yeah. That's the reason why. Yeah. And that's why today's modern Bible versions came from here. But we'll come back to them another time. So Satan was starting out heresy after heresy. Now Constantine was the one that the devil was waiting for. Constantine was practically the last Roman emperor and actually practically the first Roman pope. So it wasn't the Apostle Peter. He had nothing to do with Roman right. Catholicism. It was Constantine. He combined paganism with Christianity. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Rome was about to lose its secular power. And because it's about to lose its secular power, uh, he wanted to retain Roman power. So why not replace it with the religious power? That's brilliant. If your governmental power is about to be lost, just retreat to religion and you'll retain your power. And what he did was is that he started, to, uh, repl uh, he started to put all the pagan stuff and replaced it with something Christian. That way you couldn't tell if it came from pagan or not. So that's why the Roman Catholics, how they would get it, is that the pagans had their day uh, worshipping the day of the sun. And then he replaced that with the day where the Christians were worshipping Christ on the first day of the week. That way you couldn't tell the difference. He had uh, the pagan temples, and then where the Christians were meeting in the buildings, he just, he just mingled the two together. And that's why he had these uh, pagan church. That's why when you look at these pagan church buildings, they, a lot of them look pagan. Why? Because it has a history of paganism. He also took a lot of the Christian symbols and mingled it with pagan symbols. Wow. So that's why you get your Jesus fish, but that one actually comes from a pagan symbol belief. So it, it, it's mingled with a lot of paganism. Uh, the sun god Ra, his symbol, uh, the sun worship, that's actually from the sign of the cross, believe it or not. So a lot of it, Constantine mingled. So thus, blending paganism, Roman paganism, and Christianity together. Why? Because Christianity was growing. You can't stop it. So why not mingle it with heresy, and then you can continue the devil's system? And he succeeded. Eventually, as time passed by, it's not like Roman Catholicism, here I am, it's born officially. It had to come through centuries and centuries of heresies. Constantine was the one that really laid it out, but then more early popes that came after Constantine and church fathers who came after Constantine, they were the ones laying down Catholic doctrine one by one. As they lay down Roman Catholic doctrine one by one, that's how the Roman Catholic evil system was born. It was born through one heresy after another heresy after another heresy. That's why Bible-believing Christians do not allow even one heresy. We don't believe in that. So we stand for right doctrine. Why? We know our history. Just uh, let it little by little, and then you'll create a monster religion. As time passed by, these people's writings and their decrees built up the Roman Catholic system. Pope Siricius, he created the word Pope. Augustine, the church father, said sprinkling baptism for babies is part of salvation. And he was the one who applied all the verses for the nation of Israel to Roman Catholics, the church as a spiritual Israel. 
Replacement theology is right. from the birth of Catholicism. Celestine I replaced the pagan goddess with the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. And Church Father Jerome, he created the Catholic Latin uh, Vulgate Bible. Uh, Bible. <laughs> so he created the Catholic Latin Vulgate Bible. So then the Catholics now, they have their Bible. So we have a corruption of so many different Bibles spreading about that it was ridiculous. And then the Dark Ages, that's when the Dark Ages came to the scene. And when the Dark Ages came to the scene, it was a time of terror, and it was a time of darkness. It was very, very sad, and it was a very, very dark timetable. During the Dark Ages, the Inquisition was a dreadful order where basically that uh, without notice, you, if they would summon you in court, they would just drag you to court. And they would drag you to court, and then if, uh, if they find you guilty, you have to prove yourself innocent. It's not that you have to prove the person guilty, you have to prove the innocence. So it was a very dark timetable. They would force you through torture to confess to your crime. So that's how they would get the crime out of you. But a lot of it was just false confession. Why? Because they don't want to be tortured anymore. Yeah. Okay, I'm guilty. What I did was wrong. The tortures were just so horrendous that what they would do is, one example was the rack, and in the rack they would tie your arms and your legs with these thin ropes, and when they stretch you out on these thin ropes, these thin ropes would slice through your kin, uh, skin, slice through the muscles, and the one uh, historian accounted that blood would squirt out to five to eight different directions as you would be hanging midair, and they would stretch you out on this rack, tearing out your bones and your innards. And then they would have the water table as another torturous device. The water table is where they would lie you down, and they would force down a rough rag down your throat, and then they would drown you at the same time with water. That way that rough rag can be forcibly thrust down, all the way down to your uh, innards over here, and once it reaches to your innards, then they would tear out the rag and then it will tear out all your insides. Sometimes they would even pour down boiling water just to add the pain as they forced down that rough rag. And other torture devices included uh, the pulley. The pulley, they would tie your hands backwards like this and hang you midair like this. And while they hang you midair like this, they would add a hundred pounds of weight on the bottom of your feet. By adding a hundred pounds of weight at the bottom of your feet, then they would suddenly let go of the rope. As they let go of the rope, then they would cat, they would grab the rope as you dang, as you fall midair, and then grab the rope and then stop you midair, and then your arms would obviously snap and your body would tear itself apart due to the heavy weight. Then they would set your bones back on again and pull you up for another round and repeat it constantly over and over again. Burning at the stake was definitely uh, not a fun execution. That was the thing how they executed people was burning people at the stake. You burn for hours. That's how long you burn. You burn for hours. That's how long you die. If you're lucky, then what's going to happen is you're going to choke to death under heavy smoke and die. If you're even more lucky, you're going to confess to being guilty. And these Catholic priests, out of mercy and forgiveness, they would call it, they would tie gunpowder bags around your neck and then make sure the flame catches the gunpowder bag on fire so that your head can blow off while you're being burnt alive at the stake. That's what they considered mercy. The Inquisition totaled down a range, a range somewhere between 50 to 100 million victims. Now that's a number that has been debated throughout history. However, I went through a university professor, he wrote a thick paper on this, and what he did was he simply compared statistics throughout, uh, about the population numbers, even counting the Black Plague numbers, and he'll tell you, you know, it's this huge drop of numbers throughout the years. And why? Because the, the Inquisition slayed off millions of people. Wow. It's that big, it's that huge. Catholic uh, apologists, they'll say, well, you can't burn, at that rate, you can't burn like, uh, how, uh, burning at the stake takes hours, 
So when the next person comes up to burn out the state next, you know, you can't get more than, what, probably 20 people per day and it goes 24-7. That's what their argument is. But that's a dumb argument. They don't burn one person at a time. They burn like a, a, scores of people around one stake sometimes. They burn, they burn thousands. And they kill millions off through torture and death. That's the a, that's a corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. There was so much uh, uh, blindness. There was so much blindness. You might say, why is that? There was spiritual blindness because they didn't have the Word of God. They were blinded by false Bibles, and they couldn't read the Bible for themselves. And there was complete uh, blindness and dependency upon their secular religious leaders. So... It was that political, religious leaders. And because of that, they were not able to look through the scriptures themselves. And because they were not able to look through the scriptures themselves, it was like a communist socialist regime. Excuse me. It's, uh, it's, it's during that time a dark age regime. All right, we'll come back to here. But see, that's how they control the people, and that's what the devil wants to do right now. It's not much different. You'll notice. Right, right. I mean... Why? Because people, they were just too stupid that they just believed whatever their professor said at their schools. and whatever. Why? Because my priest is educated. He has degrees. So whatever Professor So-and-so says about whatever's going on with this crazy situation that we're living in 2021, I'll believe whatever they say. Yeah. See? So that, there was a complete blindness, a complete dependency upon their leaders. The corruption was very, very widespread. It's not a joke. The corruption of uh, religious leaders was so rampant and bad that you would hear scandal after scandal of these people. The popes, they were not your holy men. They slept with whores. They bought the papal office with bribes, committed adultery on the supposed tombs of Peter and Paul had dozens of illeg illegitimate children running around the Vatican, wow. lavished themselves with billions of dollars worth of gold, that they went far beyond debt and bankruptcy, and worst of all, some of these sins, they did it in the name of Jesus Christ. You want to hear something worse than that? When they tortured people in this uh, dark age of the Inquisition, they called it, they did it in the name of Jesus Christ when they tortured people. Father, we ask your blessing, and they would sprinkle holy water on these tortured devices before they tortured these people, asking God's blessing upon it. It was a time of dark ages and wickedness. It looked like that all hope was lost, and the devil succeeded. He wiped out Christianity. He replaced it with something totally pagan and totally dark and evil. But then the Lord... He sent in some light that time. He sent in some light that time. During this time, what we call the Reformation, the Lord was raising out some Christian leaders to come back and to fight against this evil, wicked system. Amen. You hear about the Vaudois. They were also later called Waldensians that time. I would encourage you to read their history books. It would melt your heart. These people, they were basically missionaries in southern and central Europe. They would go out two by two, just like you're doing door knocking, and go to region after region and try to witness people about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. They, these people memorized passages, chapters, and even books of the Bible. They would just memorize so much, so much scripture. As a matter Lord. of fact, they would even have, they would make their own tracks of scriptures and they would hide them in their pockets within their suit coats. Whenever they sleep at an inn, when they would leave the inn, they would write a scripture verse as their gospel track and leave that behind at the inn so that hopefully the person can get saved. These people, they memorized so much scripture that one of the inquisitors witnessed one of the Waldensians quoting an entire book of the Bible while he was being burnt alive. And the inquisitor even wrote that down. He couldn't deny that these people memorized scripture. The Vaudois, they loved their Bible so much. In fact, because they treasured and valued their Bible so much more than us today, that they were the ones responsible for one of the manuscript evidences, and that's the old Latin Bible. So the Roman Catholics had their wicked Catholic Latin Vulgate, 
But then the Vaudois had their old Latin before Jerome did that. And this one competed with the Alexandrian manuscripts. Scholars today boast these manuscripts are second century. That's why we have to go by these manuscripts. But guess what? Old Latin goes far back a second century as well. Yeah. Far back as to 120 AD. Right. 120 AD, these people. They had the scriptures roaming around that time. In fact, when one of the Waldensians was about to be burned at the stake, he actually told those uh, inquisitors and his persecutors, you better get more firewood to burn than us Waldensians to burn. Woo. The reason why is because they memorized too many scriptures. So because they memorized too many scriptures, the word of God was spreading like wildfire. So he quoted to them, the word of God endureth forever as he was being burnt alive at the stake. And the Lord raised up uh, Heyday in southern and central Europe. You got the Vaudois. And the Lord was raising up Heyday within the headquarters of Rome itself. Go to Italy. Savonarola shook up the place over there. Savonarola, that man, he ministered to the people in Italy, and he called out the corruption of the popes and the Catholic Church. He was a preacher forbidden under the ban of the Pope to continue his work. But he kept continuing his work, and he even held bonfires to burn up sexual, pagan, and worldly objects. Amen. Amen. That, he was hardcore. The, one of those Catholics, they tried to bribe him, and they said, you know what, we'll give you a red cardinal's hat. Would you like a red cardinal's hat? We'll, we'll offer you the position of red cardinal. And he instead replied back, I'll take a red hat of blood instead. Wow. And then he, they got mad at him, and he got his red hat of blood. They tied him up at the stake, and then the priest, he basically, so he basically was saying to Savonarola that I separate thee from the Church of Rome. But Savonarola, he replied back to him, you might separate me from the church down here, but you can't separate me from the church up there. Yeah. As he was being burnt alive at the stake. Yeah. John Wycliffe was the next guy who gave heyday in England. The Catholic Empire corrupted throughout the entirety of Europe, and God was knocking them out one by one, giving headache after headache to every Catholic power and official in every major country. John Wycliffe ministered in England. He was a scholar in Oxford. He was known as the morning star of the Reformation. And he's the one that got the people, the scriptures, the English Bible. So he got the English Bible going, which is where our King James Bible was able to come from, because of people like Wycliffe. Amen. So then John Wycliffe wrote the English Bible, and guess what? He wrote it by hand. He wrote the, the English Bible, all of it by hand. Oh, and by the way, uh, I could be wrong about this, but last time I checked, there's more than a hundred handwritten copies still alive from Wycliffe's. Wow. They're all handwritten, by the way. Wow. All right, they didn't have your technology printers. Yeah. Praise the Lord. His followers were dedicated. They treasured the scriptures. And not only that, they were ragged street preachers. Poor people. Yeah. Didn't have a living or a home. But what they did was they went around community, community, preaching the gospel Amen. on the streets. These guys were called lollards. The enemies called them lollards, making fun of them uh, for lar, you know, for their babble or their being hecklers or being troublemakers. But Wycliffe didn't care and his poor followers didn't care. One time he fell ill near death, and then the friars hurried to his bedside, hoping he would recant. And they said, he might give us his last rites, but Wycliffe preached to them, I shall not die but live, and again declare the evil deeds of the friars. God answered his prayer, he lived, and then he kicked the friars harder than he ever did before. Amen. And then John Huss was another man that gave them a headache, and he was in Czechoslovakia. And John Huss, that time, he was influenced by Wycliffe's writings. So the poison was spreading. He was a scholar in Prague. As he was a scholar like Wycliffe as well. And they were spreading Wycliffe's writings throughout the students in the schools that time. 
Uh, just like they're just uh, throwing in like uh, Rutland commentaries during your Bible schools and colleges, right? And the poison spreads, right? It's kind of similar to something like that, what Huss received. And he was burned at the stake, why? For preaching in his own people's tongue. That was forbidden. The Catholics said, no, you've got to speak only Latin because that's the holy language. That's God's language. But uh, Huss didn't care, and he was burnt alive for Jesus Christ. When he was tied to the burning stake, he rejoiced, My Lord Jesus Christ was bound with a harder chain than this for my sake. And why then should I be ashamed of this rusty one? Wow. When the priest replied to John Huss, We commit thy soul to the devil, John Huss immediately said to God, But... I do commit my soul into thy hands, O Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he died singing hymns while he was being burnt alive. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. And then the same day that Huss was burnt alive at the stake, the wicked Catholic system, they dug up John Wycliffe's dead corpse the same day. Why? To teach the people a lesson. Don't mess with us. Don't give us a headache. We're going to haunt you. Whether you're alive or you're dead, we're still going to condemn you. And that's what they proved through Huss and Wycliffe. So they dug up Wycliffe's dead body the same day Huss was condemned to the stake. And they condemned Wycliffe's body to be burnt. So much good that would do. He's already dead. I don't know why you would bring a dead corpse to trial. And then what they did after that is that they took the ashes of Wycliffe's dead body and tossed it to the... Uh, tossed the ashes to the Elbe River. That's what they did. Then they thought, oh, we got rid of the heretics. We finally got rid of them. We taught them that whether you're alive or dead, we're going to get your soul either way. We're going to get you. You have no power over us. But Hus, his, na his name means goose. And he gave a little prophecy to the Catholics. He told them, you are now going to burn a goose but in a century, you will have a swan, which you can neither roast nor boil. Mm -hmm. We shall see that swan later on. Mm -hmm. Before that swan came out, the Lord raised up a man, a scholar of scholars that even the Roman Catholics respected. His name is Desiderius Erasmus. That's Desiderius good. Erasmus was yeah. the one who got those uh, Greek manuscripts, right? The Antioch region, they were responsible for the Greek manuscripts. And he was responsible for the manuscripts of our King James Bible. Yeah. And that's the Textus Receptus, also known as TR. TR. He, the Textus Receptus manuscripts. Because of this uh, brilliant scholar, he created a scholastic base manuscript evidence for the Bible believers in the future. Brilliant scholar praised by kings all over the world. In fact, even King Henry VIII even praised Erasmus's intellect. He was undercover in the Catholic Church. Right. Why? Because he's a scholar. You're going to get your academia, your degrees uh, through the Catholic Church. Oh, just like how I got mine, right? Uh, At this liberal area? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's what you have to do nowadays. So uh, he did undercover. It's kind of something like I went through. And he wrote, and at the meantime, he was writing tracts cr criticizing the Catholic Church while undergoing the Roman Catholic hey, system. And then he also translated the Textus Receptus manuscript from the Vaudois, the Waldensians, Old Latin. And then as he was doing that, it eventually spread. The Vaudois created a base from their old Latin, and combining it uh, with uh, Erasmus, it, it later spread from these two bases, Luther's German manuscripts, Diodati's Italian manuscripts, Olivetan's French manuscripts, Valera's Spanish manuscripts, and then Tyndale's English, yep. and all the right Bible languages today. It is from the base of the Greek manuscripts that Erasmus laid out, combined with the Waldensians' Old Latin. So that's how the Lord mightily used it. Then the swan came. The swan was Martin Luther. Martin Luther, when he came to the scene, he was a monk. 
dedicated to the Roman Catholic system. But he was a very troubled soul. And he always doubted his salvation. As a matter of fact, he committed the unpardonable sin. During his confession, he said to his confessor, you know, I can never love God. And then the confessor said, but you must love God. You must repent. And then Luther said, I tried. I tried so hard. But every time I try to see a loving God, I, all I see is an angry God instead. Why? Because the Catholic Church put terror on people's souls. Yeah. And then made them doubt their salvation, made them a slave to the system. And Luther forever doubted, and he was so scared of his salvation that all he saw was a wrathful God. And so he was depressed and discouraged. The confessor sent him to Rome so that he can be encouraged. Luther was encouraged when he went to Rome, and he said, Holy Rome, I salute thee! But when he went inside Rome, he was in shock as he saw the corruption, as you have heard before, of all these Catholics with uh, brothels drinking and uh, bribes and uh, mistreatment of the poor people and everything going out in publicly on the streets. And when Luther saw that, he was disgusted. And in fact, he changed his mind and he said, if there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. Yeah. Amen. What happened later on is that he started to study into theology, and as he studied theology and studied the scriptures, finally, right, then his eyes began to be open. And when he read Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith, that saved his soul. And he said, all right, it's by faith, it's not by works. Right. And then he got Amen. saved, and then uh, he started to teach and preach that amongst his uh, Catholic peers and in his Catholic church. Because Luther never uh, broke off from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So that Luther, what he was doing was, within the Catholic Church, he was preaching the right salvation. The, the Catholic uh, peers and the scholars, especially the Pope, were not happy about that, actually. So they were enraged. And Luther, he just kept preaching salvation by faith, not by works. One guy, one guy named Tetzel... He started to sell out these indulgences. Indulgences were actually these paper form that if the people bought it, then you would get a forgiveness yeah. of sins from burning off a certain amount of time from purgatory. Yeah. So then uh, the Pope, Pope Leo, he wanted to build the Vatican. You know how your Vatican is built? It's because of idiots like Pope Leo who was going bankrupt all the time. But then he wanted to uh, spend lavish money on this Vatican building. So then, you know what he said? I'm going to get the money from off the people. We're going to make a special sale of indulgence. Yeah, yeah. And make it very special that we're going to make money off these people. And then Tetzel, because he's such a good, uh, he's such a good dra dramatic storyteller, he exaggerated and advertised it to the point you'll get full forgiveness of sins no confession necessary for you guys right. if you buy this piece of paper. Wow. And not only that, uh, you can save a lost soul, a loved one of yours who's burning in purgatory will immediately go to heaven if you buy this wow. piece of paper. Wicked. So then it was so evil. Luther was so mad. So then he wrote 95 to 99 arguments against this special sale of indulgences. And then he hammered it right in front of the Catholic Church door Amen. for everybody to see. Amen. And then when people started reading that, it started to spread like wildfire. Right, right. Tetzel got so angry. And then it started to reach the ears of the Pope. And the Pope got even more angry. And one of the things in the thesis actually read it this way about the Pope. If the Pope really has pure Christian charity, why will he not empty up all of purgatory then? Yeah. Why would he have to go through the special sale of indulgence to free a soul from purgatory? You know, why not just empty up all of purgatory if he really loves all these souls? The Pope got mad and he said, what drunken German wrote those words? <laughs> and then they said it was Martin Luther. And Leo said, we're going to uh, put a ban on Luther. He's going to be excommunicated. So they put an excommunication on Luther, told him he had 60 days to retract the writings. Mail, I guess, came in late. He only had one day left. And Luther, what he did at the night time, where he's supposed to be excommunicated, took that Pope's ban and said, Rome, because you destroyed the works of God, let God destroy you in these flames. And he tore that papal bull in half 
and threw it in the fire. And all of Wittenberg City who saw that, they got egged up and they said, yeah, and they threw their Catholic objects and books and the papal bulls into the fire too. Well, so that didn't really help, actually. So then now the religious empire separated from Luther, but now the secular empire. The most powerful emperor of that time was Charles, Emperor Charles. And King Charles, he, because he's tied to the Roman Catholic Church, he wanted to put the ban on Luther as well. And when Luther stood before trial, he said that I cannot go against conscience. Uh, if my conscience go, is bound to the text of the Bible, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Yeah. And so the, now the secular world had to ban Luther too. So now he's banned by both secular religious powers. He had nowhere to go. Yeah. One time he was with, within a famous uh, debate with one of their famous Catholic scholars, Eck. And as Luther debated Eck, Eck pointed out that... Uh, you know, no one ever taught what you taught before. You know, this is heresy. This is like a cult, a new teaching, right? Like some of you Bible believers get, right? And then Luther said, I don't care. If, uh, I don't care if, you're, if the Catholic scholar says it or if John Huss's follower says it. I disagree with both crowds. What I say is the truth. And then Eck got so disgusted, and he said, Martin Luther, do you think you're the only one that knows the truth? And then Luther said, I'll tell you what I think. I have the freedom to believe what I want to believe in as found in the word of God. Amen. And then he cried out, a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. And Eck flew in, into a oh, scream yeah. and rage Amen. and said, oh, yeah. heresy, that is heresy. Yeah. <laughs> but Luther didn't care and he marched on. The Lord protected Luther because one of the dukes realized Luther's intellect and how the Lord was using him, so the Duke protected Luther. Yeah. And Luther was underground, and he completed his German Bible. Yeah. Later on, Luther's plague was spreading everywhere that there were rulers and dukes even uh, adhering and listening to Luther's teachings. So because of that, Luther now had, a, uh, now had enough protection. So the emperor was under pressure because he needed every political leader on his side. So he summoned all of uh, those uh, secular leaders who sided with Luther's teachings. And he said that, unite with me, abandon these heresies, and let's go under one universal church, the Catholic church, and march against the common enemy. But uh, one, of, one of the dukes would not recant. And the other duke stepped forward, and another duke stepped forward, and he said, you cannot go against our conscience. And another person said, we believe that by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are made free Christian men, free now and free forever, amen. And then one of these dudes stepped up one by one and said, if you want to kill me, then go ahead and kill me right now, and offered their head to the emperor, wow. or the emperor to cut off his head. One duke after one, another duke and another duke. The, the emperor knew he couldn't do that. Yeah. He loses power. Yeah. So thus, finally, the Catholic empire crumbled because of one man that the Lord used, a swan. And then God was not done. Luther shook up Germany. This guy set up the manuscripts. He set up Prague, England, Italy, South Central Europe. Now the Lord wanted to kick Scotland. And then he raised up John Knox. And John Knox, in fact, this man was such a prayer warrior that the Catholic Queen of Scots, Mary Queen of Scots, was so scared of John Knox's prayers. John Knox, he was imprisoned in the galleys for 19 months. And that's the worst kind of slavery and imprisonment during the Dark Ages, is to be summoned at the galleys. But, you know, despite of such ill treatment, you know, Knox wasn't scared of the queen. The queen was scared of John Knox. Queen of Scots cried out, I fear John Knox's prayers more than all the assembled armies of Europe. Wow. And that's how John Knox was such a prayer warrior that he would pray, give me Scotland or else I die to the Lord. And that's what scared Mary Queen of Scots. That's what scared the Catholic Empire. And the Lord raised up another hero. He wanted to kick England's butt again, so then he sent down William Tyndale. And William Tyndale, because John Wycliffe's English Bible was an older English language that time, uh, Tyndale, he had to 
given the newer English language of that time. And when he updated the English to the language of his people that time, uh, Tyndale was a scholar as well, knew all the languages. Uh, he knew a, a lot of the different languages, vernacular tongues, to translate the Word of God. And then as he was sitting one time with the Catholic scholars, he said something similar that Luther would say. When the, one of the Catholic scholars asked him what he thought about the Pope, Tyndale replied back, I defy the Pope, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than the Pope does. Oh, man, that kind of scholar threw up bit. So then Tyndale was obviously not saved. So he was, his life was on the run as he kept translating the Bible into English. Right. And he was able to successfully uh, to complete his New Testament. Praise the Lord. But then what happened later on as he was translating other parts in his Bible, the Catholics sent down their agents, their undercover spies, right. and they caught Tyndale eventually. And then... Tyndale, he didn't complete his English Bible. They tied him against the burning state. It looked like Tyndale was going to lose his work. How else do we have the King James Bible today? Looked like we'll never get it. But then William Tyndale, he gave a prayer to the Lord. And during that time, you know who was the king of England that time? One of the worst kings you can think of. King Henry VIII. There was no way that Tyndale is going to get help. Tyndale gave a prayer to the Lord. Lord... Open the king of England's eyes. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's no way. Not King Henry VIII. He died burning at the stake. But you know what God did to answer his prayer in a mighty way? King Henry VIII, he had his committee look up Tyndale's work. And, yeah. and they couldn't find errors. And King Henry VIII, because he was so wicked, arrogant, prideful, he broke off the Catholic Church himself. And not only that, he could do whatever he wants, and no pope and priest can tell him what to do. So he said, you know, if there's no errors in Tyndale's Bible, let it be spread abroad through all yeah, the people. Yeah. Now the Bible didn't have to be hidden by the dwas. Yeah. Now it can be public to all the people. Yeah. Oh, the Catholic Church got stinking angry. They lost England now. They lost England, all because of a dying man's prayer. Yeah, and the Lord raised up our heroes, and this is where our... One of our history came from is Anabaptist. Anabaptists, yeah. they would come from the Vaudois themselves, actually. The Anabaptists, which is eventually where we get the later Baptist herit heritage and the other people. Of course, there's still a bit of a difference. However, oh, no. there's no doubt that the Anabaptists, that they were a very significant part for Baptists to go back to. The Anabaptists, they were actually old-time Vaudois, old-time Waldensians. They spread all over Europe. They were extremists. I mean, these guys were the extremists right, right. by even these people as well, even compared to Luther as well. Even Luther's followers considered the Anabaptists as extremists. It kind of sounds like today's Bible-believing churches who are considered the oh. extremist bunch of Christians, yeah. the extremist bunch of the independent fundamental King James-only crowd. That's right? Yes. We're the ones that are the extremists, criticized by our own fellow brethren. That's the Anabaptists. You know why? They had the same like-mindedness as you. They just had more knowledge of the Bible. Right. In fact, they gave a pain in the neck to their uh, Lutheran peers and, and the Catholic peers because they were just so well-learned in scriptures. They were called Anabaptists because they believed in Rebaptism. You might say, why did they baptize again? Because the first baptism that they had were that they had as infants did not count. Amen. So they had to get baptized again. Oh, they hated that. That was considered heresy, even amongst the Lutherans. So then because of that, uh, they were considered extremists. They had no home. They wandered place to place, no safety, persecuted by the Catholic Church. But uh, these Bible believers debated so successfully. That the Catholic Inquis Inquisitors, they, they just hated these Anabaptists. One Anabaptist had his tongue cut out, flesh torn seven times by iron tongs, and finally burnt alive. But before he even went through all that, you know what he told those Catholic scholars? Send for the most learned men. If they show us with Holy Scripture that we are in error and wrong, 
we will gladly retract and recant and will gladly suffer condemnation and the punishment for our offense. But if we cannot be proved in error, I hope to God that you will repent and let yourselves be taught. Yeah. That sounds like the Bible believer. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder they had to take out his tongue and then tear his flesh seven times. Right, right. They hated the Anabaptists. That's where we came from. With this history of where we come from, now the devil, both the devil and the Lord realize that there's a showdown going on. And Whoa. that is England. All eyes now are on England. Now the, these two streams are colliding. They've been colliding ever since. They kept battling ever since. Now who's going to take over the territory of England? So it was a showdown of Catholic and Protestant kings after King Henry VIII died. Edward VI, when he took over, he was a Protestant and he authorized... 35 editions of the New Testament. And then he, but he unfortunately died at 15 years of age. Wow. So then the Protestants lost their champion. The Catholics took over immediately through Bloody Mary. Why was she called that way? Because she burned and she executed and killed thousands, if not hundreds, of uh, believers. She married Philip II of Spain. Now, for some of you who don't realize this, that's pretty bad. Because Philip II of Spain, he's the one that's in charge of the Sp uh, Spanish Inquisition, which is the worst Inquisition. And not only that, Philip II of Spain was more powerful than King Charles. So he was the world's most powerful emperor. There was no way the Christians were going to have a chance in England through Bloody Mary. But you know how the Lord intervened? Bloody Mary died childless. So because of that, the Lord protected England's throne. So because Bloody Mary died childless, what happened was Queen Elizabeth then began to take over, and she prospered England's Protestant empire. So under Queen Elizabeth, who was very successful that time, and that's where we know where we get a lot of our uh, Shakespearean plays and etc. But during Queen Elizabeth's reign, it was definitely prosperous. Why? Because she was more Christian than Catholic. That's the thing. So that's pretty obvious. And then the Jesuits, they wanted to kill her. They wanted to kill her so badly. So they plotted attempts to assassinate her. However, she survived every assassination attempt and killing. So then the Catholics, they raised up Mary, Queen of Scots. The same Mary, Queen of Scots that was troubled by John Knox's prayers. So the Mary, Queen of Scots, the Catholics were hoping that through her that she can uh, foul up Queen Elizabeth's reign and take over. They wanted her to dethrone Elizabeth. But in the end, what happened was that Elizabeth won at the end. And then Queen of Scots faced her execution at her end. So then the, the showdown of Catholic kings and queens, it could not work. So then the Queen of Scots could not work. All, the, the showdown of royalty could not work. So then what they had to do was, all right, Guess what? Don't forget she has her husband, the world's most powerful emperor. He sent in his famous Spanish armada. That was the, the world's most powerful fleet. There was no way they were going to win. So then the Catholics, they wanted the Spanish armada to defeat uh, England and take it over. And then by doing so, England will fall on its knees to Catholicism once more. However, the, the, it was another God sent thing. You notice how the Lord's, there was no doubt the hand of God was behind this yeah, every step man. of the way. Absolutely. Throughout, as the empires went, the, the rulers went back and forth, the Spanish Armada. If you know the story, what you're going to hear is this, is that basically, coincidentally, coincidentally, there was a big, huge wind yep. that blew off the Spanish Armada fleet <laughs> off to the coast of Iceland. So then they lost a huge amount of their uh, fleet over there, and they could not battle and attack. So then because of that, England's ships, they were able to conquer the all-powerful Spanish Armada fleet. Philip, uh, King Philip, he suffered the worst humiliation ever in history, and the Catholic Empire crumbled. Now that. it changed to England now. Why? Catholic power was ruined by, ever since that Spanish Armada. So now, England was the attention. Now, 
the Lord says, it's time. Now let's start the KJV translation work. And the devil knew, this is it. This is it. I got to stop this. I, I knew this day was going to come when they had the freedom. I got to stop this. King James hired scholars from Westminster, Cambridge, and Oxford to translate the King James Bible based off of the TR manuscripts from Erasmus right. and then uh, combine it with all the other European manuscripts that you've heard me quote out. The KJV translators culminated everything. And then through these uh, manuscripts, they were able to write out the King James Bible. The Jesuits were extremely furious. So then they had... they successfully had two people infiltrate actually the KJV committee, translation committee, and they successfully inserted the Catholic Apocrypha. That's the reason why your original King James Bible has the Apocrypha in it. So then the Catholics, they try to uh, do whatever they can to insert anything Catholic. Uh, however, the KJV translators, and then the system was set up in such a rigid way that there was no way a person can put a biased translation in there. There was no way they could get away with it. The translators were being watched, and uh, you had to get the eyes of the public as well. So because of that, the KJV translators knew that was not the Word of God, the Apocrypha. Right, right. So that's why they wrote Apocrypha on every single page of the Apocrypha that was in between in their King James Bible. Right. Kind of like concordance, concordance, mm -hmm. written in every word at the end of your Bible, or map, 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 or reference, 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 index, 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 written in every page at the last pages, beginning pages, or middle pages of your Bible. Why? To show that that's not part of the scriptures. Yes. If you look at your scriptures, you'll notice that it's blank over there. So then the and not only that, what happened is that uh, word came out about the two being, about infiltration. So then because of that, the KGB translators were on guard. So that didn't work. So then what they had to do was then they had to, well, uh, let's publish our Catholic Dewey Reigns Bible. And this was published, you know when it was published? Two years before the King James Bible was published. What a coincidence, right? right? What a coincidence. See that? Because the devil knew that I have to stop this work. Yeah. But guess what? You know, who, who uses Dewey Reigns today, you know? And that ain't even a popular Bible amongst y'all today. Nope. So because of that, uh, the Lord foiled that one up. So then the Jesuits said, okay, we got to stop this. This is not working. Our infiltration of the translation committee. Then came the gunpowder plot. The gunpowder plot, it's not actually a bunch of uh, vigilantes trying to rebel against the wicked system. No, the vigilantes, they were the evil people, actually. So these people involved at the gunpowder plot included Robert Catesby. But Robert Catesby, the one who was involved in this, his priest was a Jesuit leader. And Robert Catesby was the one that started out the plot. The plan was simple that you have to dig an underground tunnel underneath and then what we're going to do is that by building this underground tunnel then we're going to go inside the palace and then try to kidnap King James' daughter and then we'll also set up the gunpowder at the bottom and then just uh, blow up, uh, I think it was parliament, yeah, so they wanted to blow up the parliament, they wanted to blow it up. That way they can uh, stop the translation work and everything. This happened during that time. But then what happened is the Lord kept foiling their plan after plan after plan. When they were digging underground, they bumped into a wall. And they realized there was another building that was blocking them. So then they had to buy the whole building. That way they can continue their digging. But as they uh, continued the digging, Parliament delayed the meeting. So then because of that, uh, they already laid out the gunpowder. And it's getting, like, uh, it's getting unusable now. And they're saying, we got to get this going. And finally, they had everything going. But for some weird reason, the Lord did something where King James, I guess out of some wit, sent in somebody to the basement at 4 in the morning. And then just by chance, of course, then they caught one of the people who's about to light up the gunpowder. And they said, what's your name? And then the guy was shocked. And then he had to give his name. And he said, my name is John Johnson. Well, that was obviously a lie, so then they know that there's something fishy. 
So then they interrogated him, and they found his fellow assassins. And then now the assassins, they knew their plan was getting foiled out. So then their last plan was, we're going to shoot it out, and we're going to make a last stand. But even the Lord foiled that one up because their gunpowder was wet. So then they were getting slaughtered by the soldiers. And then so what they tried to do was they tried to dry off the gunpowder by, li by lighting a fire next to it. That was the dumbest thing ever. And then they, in they blew up. They injured themselves. So here are a bunch of these uh, people hired by the Jesuits and the Catholics that the Lord just totally ruined their plan and their work. What a devil. And what happened was Robert Catesby... As he was bleeding and dying, it was proven that they're definitely Catholics. Because as he was bleeding and dying, he crawled to the image of the Virgin Mary, gave his last prayer, and died at the feet of the statue of the Virgin Mary. So it is very sad how dark of a system, and you can tell that this was definitely Catholic dealings behind it. There was no doubt about that. And then, the Lord let it open. Amen. And the devil could not stop it, no matter how many times he attacked. That's right. Now people had it. Amen. They began to preach, thus saith the Lord. Amen. 1611 came. Amen. The King James Bible was born, and people preached. Let us see what the Lord did that just changed our whole world. Ever since the Lord, he started to bless with the founding of the King James Bible. Now... People were hearing, thus saith the Lord. They were no longer hearing their priests anymore. They were no longer blinded to a state religion system anymore. Now everyone was free to study the Bible, him or herself, and be able to find freedom and truth in the Word of God. Now doctrine was growing, preaching was growing, revival was spreading, missions were spreading about. In came one of the greatest errors in our history, and that is the Great Awakenings. The Great Awakenings was definitely a time of revival. The world was being shaken all around, and people were getting saved. People were repenting. People were getting right with God. Amen. And there were uh, more people accepting the call of the missions. So God was uh, spreading. A, God was spreading out the Great Awakenings, and this was such quite a revival. It shook up. It shook up the entire world. You would think that the Lord was going to uh, bring in the kingdom because there were so many people getting right with the Lord. It was a great time. Uh, story after story would fail to include you, but I can only give you a little bit. John Bunyan was one of them. John Bunyan, he was the one who wrote the famous Pilgrim's Progress that uh, even little children would be reading today. John Bunyan, he would actually preach out on the streets, but he had no license to preach. So he believed in the freedom that if God called him to preach, he's going to preach. So he would preach out on the streets. Amen. And then the council, they would arrest him. And whenever they arrest him, Bunyan would reply to the council, you arrest me today, I'll preach tomorrow. So then he just kept uh, preaching the gospel. Nothing stopped him. One time when he was in prison for quite a long time, his daughter wept in front of John Bunyan's eyes and said, Would you just uh, recant? Would you just uh, re retract and then, you know, d uh, go by what the government wants you to do and then just stop preaching? And Bunyan, he said, I'm not going to stop preaching even if the mosque grows over my eyebrows. So he was determined to, even if he was going to be in prison, to keep preaching on for the Lord. And that's how the Lord mightily used John Bunyan. Another person God used that time was uh, Edwards. Edwards was known as a person who could not preach well. He was known to be a monotone preacher. The man, he would actually just read notes while he was preaching. Just read it in a monotone voice. But the Lord mightily used Edwards where he preached the all-time famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. When he preached that message, people were slipping off of their seats as if they were falling into hell. And many of them wept. And they had an all-night prayer meeting. And there was a revival that broke out. And people got right with the Lord. They repented. And people got saved because of that. Another person God used during the Great Awakening Revivals. It was definitely a great time. 
John Wesley. John Wesley, he's the one as the founder of the Methodist churches today. If you look at Methodist churches today, they, they are definitely not like uh, their, uh, their founder, John Wesley, back then. A lot of these people who are the founders of different churches and movements you'll find out today, the, today's people, they don't match up with their founders, mm -hmm. their leaders back then. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he would also do street preaching. And he would preach the gospel throughout town to town, and people would, mobs would try to kill him. But he don't care, and he kept preaching the gospel. One time there was a robber who pointed the gun at John Wesley and demanded his money. John Wesley tossed his money to the thief, and then before the thief left, John Wesley told that robber, the time will come that you will regret your ways. When that time comes, remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins. Mm -hmm. Many years later, a well-dressed gentleman went up to John Wesley and said, Do you remember that time there was a thief who uh, pointed a gun at you and wanted your money? And you said, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins? Wesley said, Yes. And that uh, fine, well-dressed gentleman said, I was that man many years ago, and I want to tell you the blood of Jesus Christ hey, passed away man. from all my sins. That's good. So he got saved, and he became a well-dressed Christian yeah. after that. Another person that the Lord used mightily was George Whitfield. George Whitfield, he was known as a voice that would boom for over a mile long. His voice could reach almost a mile George Whitfield, this guy was a preacher. You talk about a street preacher. People around the town would hear his voice. As a matter of fact, Be the deist Benjamin Franklin, one time, he couldn't stand George Whitfield's preaching, that when he would try to run away from his preaching and go in the middle of a town, he would say, as I would close my hands on my ears in the middle of the town, I would still hear his voice all across the town booming in my ears. But then the Lord was convicting Franklin <clears throat> because the Lord was mightily using Whitfield with souls getting saved, souls getting right with the Lord, that Franklin was curious. And so he attended George Whitfield's meetings. And that deist who first despised Whitfield could not but be helped but to be moved by the preaching itself. The Holy Spirit was convicting him. And what happened was is that uh, Benjamin Franklin, he wasn't going to give a dime to George Whitfield. And that rich man didn't bring a single penny with him, but after George Whitfield's preaching, he got under conviction that when offering time came, Benjamin Franklin, that rich man, had to ask the person sitting next to him, can you give me some money so I can put it at the offering plate? Wow. <laughs> so that's how the Lord was mightily using these men. As soon as that King James Bible came out, revival was spreading. Yeah. The devil couldn't stop it. That's why you notice the devil kept attacking. And you look at our history right here, the devil, he tried to stop this because he knows once this goes out, that it will be unstoppable. Another person, uh, one of my favorite characters is Billy Bray. Billy Bray, this was an old-time Methodist. If you go to today's Methodist churches, you know, they're backslidden, quiet, and dead. But if you went to Billy Bray, you wouldn't think that he's a Methodist. This man would shout, run around the room... And if there was a person who was like dead and backslidden, Billy Bray would pick up that person and run her and carry him while running around the room. <laughs> I mean, you, this, this, we're talking about, we're talking about 17 to 18 hundreds people. All right. I mean, you, you, you talk, today's, today's Christianity. I mean, they're a bunch of backsliders, but thank God we have, even now, as one of our brothers said, some people who are still keeping the fire going, right? Amen. Uh, so, uh, Billy Bray, this guy would shout, praise the Lord all the time. I mean, this man never lost the joy of the Lord. As a matter of fact, even when his wife died, Billy Bray, bl God bless his heart, you would get teared up. That man, as soon as his wife died ran around the room and said, Praise the Lord, my dear Joey has gone up with the bright ones. My dear Joey has gone up with the angels. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, man. <laughs> man, when you would see that. I mean, the doctor saw that. There was an unsaved doctor who was not a Christian. But man, you talk about the conviction that he witnessed when Billy Bray died. When Billy Bray was going to pass away in front of that lost doctor's eye, Billy Bray said, glory be to God, I shall soon be with Jesus. 
Shall I give him your compliments, doctor? Shall I tell him that you'll be coming too? Oh, man. That doctor was torn apart with conviction. And Billy Bray said, Glory, if my soul go down to hell, I'll keep shouting glory all the way that the devil will get so annoyed and he would say, Billy, Billy, this is no place for you. Get back up. And up to heaven, I would go out of hell shouting glory all the way. Amen. Yeah. The last word he said before he died, you could guess, was glory. <laughs> man. Was glory. That was quite a man. Another person the Lord mightily used was Brainerd that time. He has the famous diary. But uh, he surrendered uh, himself to the Lord uh, even during his college years and forsook the youth and the worldly life to serve the Lord. And he would spend time praying to the Lord so much. His prayers were so powerful that it was recorded that when he would pray during the heart of winter, the snow would melt around him while he would pray. One time he was praying so hard for these lost pagan Indians that one time as he went up all night in prayer, sweating and being broken, he went to the pagan ritual service that the Native Americans were holding. And then the Native Americans, they would just stop in their track and they would get the fear of God because they saw Brainerd coming out with a glow or something wow. from the presence of God Praise after he spent time in prayer. Wow. And he would convict and win the Native Americans to Christ through that. Uh, another person the Lord mightily used was uh, Charles Finney. Finney was a man that was practically a soul winner wherever Amen. he would go. This man... <clears throat> So, I mean, this man would not stop witnessing. One time, <clears throat> he would witness so much. Oh, by the way, he used to be a Mason. But then he repented and he got saved and he became a Christian. Praise the Lord. But he became such a soul winner that one time he would even go in the middle of a business factory <laughs> and witness to one person. And then what would happen yeah. is and then he would witness to the other person and then the whole people would stop to listen to him preach the gospel that even the manager and the boss who was in charge of the whole factory would stop the whole work <laughs> process just for that day yeah. and they would all hear Finney preach the gospel yeah. uh, to all of them. And then he would have church that day. <laughs> That's how much of a soul winner Finney was. Praise the Lord. Another person God mightily used was uh, Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright, this guy is, a, man, this guy was a rough preacher. Peter Cartwright, he was old-time Methodist. And uh, guess what? If you see his attitude, you wouldn't think that he's a Methodist, all right? This guy was such a rough preacher that liquor merchants feared him. They hated him. His war was with liquor merchants. One time, one, the liquor merchant and him had a falling out that one time when he, he was beating up this liquor merchant in the face while singing, All hail the power of Jesus, let angels prostrate fall. <laughs> this, guy, this guy was such a controversial rough preacher that, the, I mean, the uh, liquor was a thriving business that time. They all hated uh, Peter Cartwright. He used to be a drinker himself, and he would uh, go out and gamble and live out his life in sin. But when he got saved, he changed all that lifestyle and preached hard against those sins. One time when he was in a dance hall, <laughs> uh, one of the ladies went up to him to offer him a dance. And you know what he did? <laughs> He, uh, he took that lady's hand. What? A pastor's going to dance? Well, what he did was he took that lady's hand, and instead of dancing with her, he said, it's all about the word of prayer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pray. And then that woman, she was so much feeling guilt and embarrassment, she kept like trying to pull out, but Carvite wouldn't let her go, and he kept praying, and then, uh, Lord, I pray that you'll please help these people, and he gave a whole prayer meeting. The whole dance just stopped. Musicians, out of embarrassment, they were leaving the room. Some of the people were leaving. The other people, curious, just kept watching. And Peter Cartwright, after he prayed, he preached to all the audience. And instead of a dance hall, it turned to a church service. And so that whole dance hall building became a church building. Yeah. And then Peter Cartwright says, I'm going to send you one pastor over here to pastor you guys. Bye-bye. So then he left. <laughs> This guy, uh, that, it was a great time of revival. Another person the Lord mightily used was not a rough person, but a soft person, and his name is William Carey. 
he was a he was a poor person who I think uh, he was uh, I think he was uh, doing shoes that time, but yes. or a tailor, yeah. But this man was so poor, William Carey, but he had a burden for lost souls in India. And because of that, he didn't care about uh, his reputation. And what he became was known as the father of modern missions. Yep. Father of modern missions. Sadly, William Carey, he suffered persecution from his fellow Christians within his own family and then within the, uh, the people in India that he ministered to. But he didn't care. He had a heart for the people in India and kept being the missionary over there, the first missionary to these people. Amen. One time when he was teaching a geography class, pointing out different nations, tears would well up in his eyes when he would point his stick toward a certain nation. Why? Because he was thinking about souls. Mm -hmm. And then as he would, tears well up in his eyes, he would say, this particular region has never heard the gospel of Jesus. He would say that in the middle of class. Amen. So the Lord was using people mightily that time. Another person was Adoniram Judson. Mm -hmm. Adoniram Judson is definitely a, a man that I think is one of the most well-respected Christian heroes. Yep. Adoniram Judson, he became known as the father of American missions. And he suffered torture, imprisonment from the Burmese government. The Hindus would give a hard time to William Carey. The Buddhists gave the hard time to Adoniram Judson. He was tortured, imprisoned. His wife, was, uh, he suffered the loss of uh, two wives and several children. Why? Because after his marriage with the first wife, she died. Married the second one, she died. And then he lost many children as well. In fact, the suffering is so great where he was in prison. While he was in prison, the wife, when she gave birth to a child... She would go around a Burmese village begging the women who are more healthy than her, begging them to have those women nurse and feed her child milk because she was too weak in her health. So, but they suffered, and they had such a testimony. And, but you know what happened? The Lord mightily used it. There were headhunters later on, as the years passed by, who became the fruit all because of Adoniram Judson who started the plant over there. And then when Adoniram Judson one time wanted to minister to a certain region, the governor told him no, and Adoniram Judson asked him why. The governor told him this, my people are not fools to go by your religion, but I'm afraid yep. my people will listen to you by your scars hmm. because of the torture that wow. he went through for Jesus Christ. And that's how the Lord used Adoniram Judson to win the Burmese people's hearts. Amen. Another person the Lord mightily used that time was George Mueller. George yes. Mueller. This man, he was known as the prayer warrior. If you want to know everything about prayer, then you just read up the life of this man. George Mueller, this was a man who, would actually, who even bailed out in one of his family members' funeral service just to live out his life in sin. He was such a very wicked man, but he repented and he got saved. The Lord changed his life. He had a heart for children and started orphanages for children. But he did not even ask money, not even one dime. He never asked for money. He all relied it on the power of prayer. Through the power of prayer, he was able to pray in several, if not tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. Wow. He was able to pray in that much money. All of his answered prayer requests costed to that amount. And in Aram Judson, one famous story is where uh, there was no bread and there was no milk for the children. So one time he prayed, Lord, I pray that you'll please give us um, the children bread to eat and milk to drink. And then after he prayed, the children would be in the breakfast table. And then they would all sit around with empty plates. And then George Mueller would just wait. And then there was a knock on the door. Knock on the door. And then George Mueller opened the door. And then the baker said, you know, it was sometime like 2 or 4 in the morning, which was the exact time George Mueller prayed. And the baker said, somehow during that time, the Lord stirred my heart to bake um, <clears throat> some food for, and to give it to your orphanage. So here wow. it is. Amen. Then, uh, coincidentally after that, the milkman came following right after and said, you know, my milk cart, uh, the wheel just fell off. So the milk is going to get spoiled. I don't want to uh, waste it. I decided to give it to your orphanage. Would you take it? Crazy. See, that's a, a God of answered prayers, right? The Lord provides. Yeah, the Lord provides. 
Another person the Lord mightily used was William Booth. William Booth is the founder of the Salvation Army, for some of you who didn't know. But if you look at the Salvation Army today, all it is is just asking for money and physical needs of the people. But the Salvation Army, it's called salvation because of soul salvation. William Booth, he did tend to the poor, but his primary focus was on souls. In fact, uh, he was so burdened for souls that his famous quote is this, Oh God, what can I say? Souls, souls, souls. My heart hungers for souls. Amen. They would do street preaching unashamedly, just like the Lawlers back then. Wycliffe's poor people, the Boudoirs back then. And in fact, when they would do street preaching, these people would make fun of them, throw stuff at them, and they would throw stones, excrement, brick, and even cats at them, at these people. And these people, when they were street preaching, they would have to wear raincoats when they're street preaching. You know why? Because of the stuff being thrown at them. So that was the kind of life and ministry that uh, these people went through. You can see that they truly had a heart for the Lord. They were on fire. They didn't let anything stop them. You had William Booth. And then another person that the Lord mightily used was Moffat, Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat, he, uh, was, he became the missionary to uh, Africa. And then during that time, there was an infamous story spreading throughout the lands about an African near chief where he would act, where people would say, he's going to take up your skull, sever, sever your head, and drink your blood. Don't you dare go over there and witness to him. But Robert Moffat didn't care. He had a heart for the African near chief, and he went over there to witness to him. And what happened is Moffat got that African near chief to repent and to get saved, and he became a saved Christian, and he brought that African near chief back into his town, and the town said, who's this guy? And then Moffat said, it's that chief that you were afraid of. He just got oh, saved. And yeah. they got shocked. They are like, he don't look the same. Because the chief changed his entire dressing and everything. And then one of the uh, officials of that town was so amazed that he said, this is literally the eighth wonder of the world. Robert Moffat had a heart for the mission field. It was through him that we later hear about the famous David Livingstone later on. Robert Moffat is somewhat might, another man the Lord mightily used. Another person the Lord mightily used was Hudson Taylor. Yep. Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was, became the missionary to China. He had a heart for God's people. Just like Carrie, he was looked down upon the fellow Christians, family members, and friends. As a matter of fact, he lost his fiance because of uh, being a missionary to China, and he suffered tremendously. He suffered a lot with depression as well because he was by himself and he kept witnessing the gospel in China. It was very difficult at that time. And what happened, but the Lord mightily used Hudson Taylor because what happened is <clears throat> after he passed away, his China Inland Mission that he founded, what happened is that the communists, as you already know, took over uh, after Taylor, and they start to take over China. But the communists, they knew about Taylor. They knew about Taylor, about his influence amongst the Chinese people, the gospel. So they had to sully his reputation. So they had one of their uh, well-learned authors. I want you to read all of Hudson Taylor's material and critique it and correct it and show these communist people why he's wrong. And this communist author who took all of Hudson Taylor's work and critiqued it, got under conviction by the Holy Spirit, and he repented and he got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. from reading Hudson Taylor's materials. That's how the Lord mightily used these people. It was a great day and age of revival. Revival. The Lord was mightily moving in. The famous D.L. Moody. Yep. Uh, his, that's a name that shouldn't be missed out. That man, uh, he was such a preacher, he would get thousands on the altar. Uh, one time, he was such a zealous uh, preacher and soul winner, he went up to one man, and then he asked this gentleman, Sir, are you a Christian? And that man got so mad at D.L. Moody that he went to one of D.L. Moody's fellow Christians or deacons or whatever and told him, How dare you? How dare Mr. Moody ask me that question? If I had the right, I would punch him in the face and be right for doing so. 
And then uh, that deacon or that fellow, those Christians told D.L. Moody, you know, you have a lot of zeal, but, you know, you got to learn to be, you know, uh, don't, don't offend people like that. And that hurt uh, D.L. Moody. And then so he prayed for that person's soul. And at the same time he felt hurt and then was praying for that person, a knock came at his door and he opened and it was the same man that he offended. And that man said, you know, when you asked me when I was a safe Christian, you know, I was mad at you, but I couldn't, that question wouldn't leave my mind. I got so bothered. I want to be a safe Christian. So D.L. Moody led him to Christ after that. Uh, God was mightily using men of God that time. Uh, Moody, uh, there was one thing that was very famous where it went throughout all the news. Moody is dead. And the Moody would one time say, one, one day, you're going to read from the newspapers that Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I'm more alive than ever before. Amen. Another person the Lord mightily used was James Chalmers. He was a missionary to the cannibals. And he would go to the islands where the cannibals are at. And he had such a burden for these people. And, but he didn't care. And even with his life being threatened, one time uh, he was street preaching uh, with two other people preaching at a bunch of these cannibals. And then, uh, you know, when you're street preaching, you lose energy, right? So then Chalmers like, okay, I'm going to rest. And then when he woke up, he saw his two street preachers still preaching. And then he's like, have you been at it all night? And then one of, the per per one of his converts who was preaching all night said, Pastor, I just preached about the Garden of Eden, the flood of Noah, the promise of Abraham, and... Moses, the children of Israel, King David, and uh, now I'm about to talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, I can't stop now, uh, so he can't come uh, around. Uh, James Chalmers, that was, that was a true man. You know how he died? He was eaten by cannibals eventually. Yeah, so he was eaten by cannibals. So he laid at, this was a good man. He truly had a heart for the people and gave up his life for them. These were people back then that the Lord mightily used. It will melt your heart. Another person God mightily used was Billy Sunday. Yep. Billy Sunday was the famous man. Sunday used to be a baseball player and a drinker. But then he got saved. A famous baseball star now became a preacher. And where he was known for sliding across bases, he used that for his preaching. So where you would hear today about people sliding the bases, you know, during him singing, shouting, or something like that, all copy from Billy Sunday. So he would slide while he would preach and he would uh, break chairs and he would even rip out, rip up his outer shirts, you know, while he was preaching. But that's how the Lord mightily used him and he would get thousands of people. He would get thousands of converts. It's because of that, uh, it's because of his preaching, he was able to close the bars in the north. And that's the reason why they got that, uh, uh, that prohibition on alcohol, that 18 that went out. Why? Because of preachers like him. He closed the bars in the north because of Billy Sunday. As for the south, the bars were getting closed because of Sam Jones. Sam Jones, uh, he would, uh, he, his life was ruined by liquor. And uh, one time he was going to lose his family to liquor. But he got saved and he repented. And he preached hard against liquor. Liquor merchants hated Sam Jones. They wanted to kill him. One time a liquor merchant waved a $10 bill in front of Sam Jones' face and he said, I got this from some poor sap who bought my liquor. And Sam Jones, he just took that $10 bill away from the liquor merchant and he said, yeah, I'll keep that. The devil had it long enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they hated Sam Jones that time. That, Sam Jones was another rough preacher. He was another rough preacher. but He was the one who closed the bars in the South. But he had a teammate who also accompanied him, Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham, he was the guy who also helped in preaching against liquor and closed down the bars. Mordecai Ham, he was actually, uh, he preached so hard, and people were scared of Mordecai Ham. Liquor merchants threatened to kill <clears throat> Mordecai Ham. Uh, one time, he would try to go around and try to find the hardest convert, the hardest atheist, and he would go to a town and he would say, so who's the hardest atheist to, to become a Christian? And they would say, well, so-and-so over there. 
And this atheist farmer who heard that Sam, uh, Mordecai Ham was going to come for him, he ran away so that Ham wouldn't meet him. Ham saw him and chased after him, quartered him at a barn, and then that atheist farmer went, what you gonna do, what you gonna do? And Mordecai Ham said, I'm gonna pray for God to save you or to kill you. And that, and that, atheist, and that atheist farmer, guess what? He got saved. And guess what? His family got saved. Amen. And guess what? They all got baptized too. Amen. That was his famous prayer. Like it would put the fear of God on people. I mean, there was a bunch, there was a mob who definitely didn't believe that, and they came out with him with uh, knives, and the, the leader of the gang was going to uh, wave the knife at him, and Mordecai Han, he just said the same thing. I'm going to pray for God to kill you or to save you. And what happened is that a mill blew up all of a sudden and fell down and injured half of the mob, and then the leader actually died. You know what happened to the rest of the half of the mob? They got saved after that. Yeah. Because they yeah. got the fear of God into him. You know, this guy, uh, you know who's the guy that led Billy Graham to Christ? It's him, Mordecai Ham. You didn't know that, did you? You know how Billy Graham got saved? Under Mordecai Ham's preaching. You know, so you hear people today saying like, oh, you know, I don't think that's a Christian thing to do, or, you know, I don't know about that, and stuff like that. Well, hey, you know, look at the fruits, how the Lord used yeah. them. Yep. And Billy Graham is supposed to be the world's most beloved preacher. The world loves Billy Graham, right? But imagine, this was the guy that converted Billy Graham. How about that? Mordecai Ham, he was listed as one of the, the, the Vatican. Oh, they never forgot all this, right? So they got mad. They put Mordecai Ham as one of the four horsemen in Revelation to avoid. They wrote that down. And then another person came that uh, created what we have, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement. Another rough person. And you notice a bunch of rough preachers at those days. J. Frank Norris. J. Frank Norris. J. Frank Norris is the guy who was responsible for the Baptist churches to become independent Baptists today. He was salient. Just like Luther was salient to start the break off of the Catholic religion, even though he was still bound to it, Norris was the one responsible for breaking off the Baptist where we can start off the independent. These people were very salient people that time in history that the Lord mightily used. There's no doubt about that. Uh, J. Frank Norris, he was such a uh, threatening preacher that the Roman Catholic Church says, well, J. Frank Norris is going to be the second of the four horsemen of Revelation. <laughs> so the Vatican targeted this guy too. J. Frank Norris, I mean, obviously he was just as controversial as J. Frank Norris, rough as Sam Jones. The liquor merchants hated J. Frank Norris. Uh, one time, a lawyer threatened him, I'm going to shut you down for life. I'm going to make sure that I throw you in prison for life. And you know what the Lord did? That lawyer was drinking, and then he got into a vehicle accident because of drinking. And then J. Frank Norris, you know what he did? That guy, you know, he took the broken bottle that the lawyer was drinking and scooped up the lawyer's brain, took that to his church service, and he said, the wages of sin is death. And then some of the people went, <laughs> obviously, you know. Some of the people collapsed, and they're like, what? Like that. But that's how the Lord used J. Frank Norris's preaching. And guess what? No matter how much the law tried to arrest him or to, the liquor merchants tried to get rid of him, his preaching had such a powerful impact against sin and liquor that when people saw the dregs of sin from liquor, what the damage it caused, they got convicted, they repented, they got right. And J. Frank Norris had thousands going. Amen. Independent fundamental Baptist churches would not exist had it not been for Norris, actually. Why? Because of the fruit. Why? That's his personality and preaching style the Lord mightily used to get the people's attention to repent. So the Lord used many people, you notice. Everybody's different. You notice that? You notice how everybody's different? But you notice the Lord used their personality, who they are, for his glory and honor. I don't want people to think that, oh, I, if, only, if only I'm more like Pastor Kim. Look, don't doubt what God has given to you in your life. That's true. Everything of what makes who you are today, the Lord wants to use it for His glory. Amen. No matter if other people look down on you too, right? That's right? How about that? See, these people didn't care. They went on for the Lord. That's how the Lord mightily used them. 
Well, uh, the devil, I think uh, he had it long enough. So he said, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm sick and tired of this. I think we got to put a stop into this. So the devil started to put a stop to this. So I think I got to move this side actually so I can write. So then what came about to conquer this uh, Great Awakening revival, what the devil did was he started, you notice here the Reformation, right? Mm -hmm. Go back to the past. The devil said, we're going to start out the Counter-Reformation. So he started out the Counter-Reformation. Okay, let's see here. This is going to be a lot of writing, so I'm going to have to put this probably to here. The Counter-Reformation was basically a reformation to counter, see that? Mm -hmm. To counter the work that the Lord was using already. So then, go back to the hellish mother church, the Vatican. They're not done. They, they haven't forgotten. What was going on throughout this whole revival? They were underground. They were underground because they lost. So they had to do something underground to conquer God's movement. One of the Jesuits, uh, he was so sick and tired of the mighty victories of Bible believers and then the Bible that came to be the King James Version later on, he hated it so much that th this Catholic Jesuit cried out, Then the Bible, that serpent, which with head erect and eyes flashing, threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground, shall be changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. For three centuries past, three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. They knew this was, this was the key. Mm -hmm. This had to be destroyed, final authority. Mm -hmm. Why do you think today's Christian churches hardly use Bible now? They, the devil knows this is it. The evil Vatican knew. Thus began the Counter-Reformation. Started out by Ignatius de Loyola. He was the one who started out the infamous Jesuit order. The most deadliest organization ever in all of history and even today is the Jesuit order. He went through, in fact, you don't realize how uh, dark they are. They don't tell you this. They won't tell you this in public schools. Loyola went through four inquisitions to prove his Catholic devotion. All right, that, that man is messed up. This is really dark. He had a book called Spiritual Exercises that even taught brainwashing and control of his followers, including the very air that they breathe. The, uh, with the Jesuit order... He was able to give birth. If you look at their uh, vows, if you reach, I believe, the fourth vow or the higher ranking, that's where it gets dark. That's where the birth of everything that you find with conspiratorial or evil leaders behind the scenes, it was birthed all the way from right there. It all birthed through there. The Jesuits made a comeback. And because of that, that's the reason why in England, the Jesuits, they were laying out plans, right, to stop this. But then when the KJV Bible came out, guess what? The Jesuits lost their power. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, is that Protestant nations were kicking Jesuits out. Then Catholic kings and queens were also kicking the Jesuits out. Because the Jesuits were doing so many things undercover that that became the paranoia. They were afraid to drink because they were afraid the Jesuits poisoned the drinks. And royalty. And then not the Jesuits were so deadly that even the Vatican itself expelled the Jesuit order, dismissed the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they were so deadly and demonic. And the Jesuits, guess what? During that time, they're still here. And they've been restored. Why? Because during that time where they were in exile, they found the Masons and they found Rothschild family. Through the Rothschild and the Masons, they combined together where you get the Scottish Rite Freemasonry. And then also what was formed at Bavaria, an institute where a Jesuit wrote down the oath for Masonry. 
and thus came out the Illuminati. The Illuminati was founded by Adam Weishaupt, and Adam Weishaupt was trained by a Jesuit. During that time, dur during the birth of America, the Illuminati infiltrated that even presidents were warning about the Illuminati people, that they were de deadly. The Illuminati people had their poison and their spread, that people were warned about these people. The Illuminati, though, they eventually became dismissed and gone, or so it was. Because the people who were disbanded from the Illuminati, they fled what it was said to Masonic lodges. And from there, behind the scenes, you don't hear much. Mm. Until later on, Cecil Rhodes, who was prosperous during the Great Awakening Revival, was influenced by Masonic lodges. And then he started his uh, round table. The round table filled with so many important people that included even Rothschild's offspring. And they set up the round table in the order that followed the ranking of uh, the highest ranking, they said, was Jesuit General Cecil Rhodes. That's why they dubbed him as. So you notice here that the, both, both Catholic Masonic influence was all, and Jewish influence, Jewish elite influences were all there behind the scenes. Throughout that time, bankers and important men were involved. And then it's through these people's names. You just have to look up these important people involved in the round table. They're the ones responsible for your banks today, like Chase Morgan, the Council on Foreign Relations, and then where you get the Trilateral Committee and all, this, uh, all these Bilderbergers, etc., Bohemian Grove and all that. They all came because of these key players who started at the round table. Thus, the undercover elite influence was starting. Now, what did they have? They got their elites. So the devil says, I have my, while the people were enjoying their revival, spreading the gospel, the devil was moving underground. Let's begin. You know, the Illuminati, I don't know if you knew this, you know where they had a huge influence? In France. You know what the Jesuits' plan were? Jesuit plans, it is said they would go 50 to 100 years ahead of time when they lay out their plans. During the Reformation and Great Awakenings, the Jesuits were quiet because they were planning out an infiltration. And then what came was higher and lower criticism. You might say, what's that? You know, Higher and lower criticism is where you get today's textual criticism. Today's academia schools criticizing the Bible, the authors who are behind it. Why? This must be done away That's right. with first. So they had to attack that. So you would be surprised. In France, that's where that your enlightenment and all that garbage started, right? The enlightenment era and the Illuminati, they had a back scene and they had some influence during that time as well. But guess what? You know who also was involved was... Uh, if you look at some of the teachers teaching higher and lower criticism during the Enlightenment era, you know what they referred to? They referred to Catholic bishops and Catholic Jesuits as their source to critique the Bible. Mm -hmm. See, so one by one. So then through the Enlightenment, they were able to attack the Bible in France. Then it spread to Germany, the heart of of the Reformation, right? Mm -hmm. And they use German rationalism. It's through the schools. It's through the schools that they were doing it. It is said that the Jesuits infiltrated over a hundred different schools and universities by that time. Then once they corrupted Germany through the schooling system, then what did they go to? Then they went to England, mm -hmm. the heart of the King James Bible. Then, where they used English deism, right? Then they went to America, the heart of the Great Awakening revival movements. So Satan won. He got his movement spreading. He won. So then, uh, the, the devil was spreading doubt throughout the schools and universities. Now, that was the heart. Schools... And universities. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. Why are today's younger generation don't get what the grown adults did? Well, where'd you send them to school? It's that simple. They knew. 
these guys knew. Go to the schools. Use education. Corrupt it. The pollution began. Let's continue on with the schools. Now the atheists, right? The liberalism. Today's uh, secular hum humanism. They are able now to revive. Why? Because they got their criticism against the Bible from the Jesuits. Don't forget, all the way here, isn't this what the devil used to corrupt? Yep. The early Christian era, too? Mm -hmm. The devil remembered. Let's go back to them. Let's reclaim them again. The devil went back. As the Reformation Great Awakening revivals were spreading, people who revived human philosophy of Plato and Aristotle came up with their own human philosophies that critiqued the Bible. You get so many different examples. David Hume, Locke, Thomas Hobbes, René Descartes, Francis Bacon, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, and all these famous philosophers where the Jesuits and then the Catholic uh, elites and the most, mostly the intellectuals behind the scenes spread their darkness. Since Jesuits were already spreading their criticisms against the Bible, all that these people had to do was reclaim theirs and use their arguments to promote their own secular, lost humanism teaching. It soon turned into the monster of humanism and Christian modernism. That was the birth of what we are going through today, isn't it? You know what we're going through today? You know what's the epitome within your schools today? Humanism and modernism. That's what happened. It gave birth to the monster. Thus, the schools fell. The devil got the schools. Next, he went to Charles Darwin. Darwin was once a the theology seminary student, but then he questioned our creation with evolution's origin of species that he wrote. There was now finally a scientific reason to get rid of God. Because why? One of the famous evolutionists, I think it was Huxley or something like that, but one of these people actually said, we have to believe in evolution. We have to promote it. Why? Because then uh, the preaching against sin that we've been hearing will have to be true. And then we'll have to change and repent of our ways and etc. So that's uh, sick and tired of it. They now have a scientific excuse to get rid of God. So they expanded the evolution ideas more. Now science fell as a result. Now let's go back to the Bible. This finally did the job. Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort, they were sympathetic with Darwin. They were sympathetic with the Catholics' beliefs. And Westcott and Hort, what they did is they, being, uh, being admirers of Darwin's writing and Catholic writings and teachings, which makes you... Why would you put these two men as in charge of revising your Bible then? Yeah. So these two men were in charge of revising the Bible. They wanted to revise the King James Bible. And they used the Catholic Vaticanus and Alexandrian Sinaiticus. Remember? They had a Catholic Bible and they had an um, uh, Alexandrian Bible. Don't forget Alexandria and what? Rome. It's always these two. And today you're seeing Alexandria and Rome revived. It's all over. Philosophy, uh, textual criticism, etc. Now you get a res Satan finally completed his masterpiece. It was called the Revised Version, the first modern English Bible version. That opened the door for others to make their own revisions. There are more than 200 different revised translations today. The devil won. Now that preachers were correcting your words in the Bible by saying, this is what the Greek says, the Hebrew says. Well, this is what the different Bible version says. Authority was lost. Now the devil won. He's saying, this is good now. Now the Bible fell. One by one, domino effect, Karl Marx. Karl Marx came to the scene, and guess what? Just like uh, uh, Darwin, you know, had some sort of Christian upbringing. Uh, was once a Lutheran family, but he created socialism on how the government was not getting in control of making sure everyone had an equal wealth. Because he's a journalist, he had the power of the media. So because of that, his uh, garbage was spreading. 
The power of the media spread his ideas, and sinners who were convicted by the Great Awakening preaching, instead of take, repenting and working for themselves and changing their lives, they wanted the government to take care of them. They want to be dependent. They want to cry out for their own share. And what happened is it opened finally to the door what the Catholics wanted a long time ago, and it's that socialist environment, become dependent upon the state, upon the government again. I don't know if you knew this, the Jesuits, they're all about socialism. You didn't know that? You didn't know that? About their economics and stuff like that? If you look at their teachings even during the early uh, centuries, even Hollywood produced movies about it, about these Jesuit missionaries and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They all talk about distributing equal wealth and making sure that it happens. Well, I have the church do it, right? Right? Oh, we, we trust these people a lot, don't we? Now, what happened? The government fell. The government fell with socialism spreading now. Hollywood was the next one the devil used. It glamorized worldly dressing, uh, excuse me, worldly dressing, worldly music, and uh, worldly entertainment. And because Hollywood was able to glamorize that, it changed the fashion, the ideals, and the, the love of the world within the minds of the younger generation, and it became a mighty success. As a matter of fact, you don't realize how much of a success that was. It was such a success that these famous uh, rock uh, hit artists that you would know, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, and all these people, you know what they were originally? Just like Marx and just like Darwin, they had a Christian upbringing back then. They were singing in church. But see, Hollywood was more appealing and worldly and glamorous. And they, and the devil used them where it spread the worldliness even much more. Why? The worldliness was very appealing. And it blinded the whole world. And it became a mighty success that even churches, for them to grow, what do they have to use? They have to use Hollywood to make it grow. You have to get the worldly entertainment, the lights, and you have to use uh, the worldly... Uh, you have to use the worldly music as well. So guess what? That's, it's such a success. Now, the world fell. The world fell because of Hollywood. The next one, the, now, uh, you got no place that's safe now. Now, the last, another one the devil used was Sigmund Freud. With Sigmund Freud, this was a, a huge problem. Sigmund Freud, he started to give uh, psychological explanations for human guilt, which, which critiqued all the religious oppression that you've learned from your older generations. What does that mean? All that preaching, that heritage that you got back then, right? So because of those psychological explanations that he was able to explain away human guilt and critique them, people found a way now to critique and explain away their human conscience if it convicts them of their right. sins. So, now conscience fell. Conscience fell. Now the devil can start attacking churches one by one. Now let's get all these churches. Let's get all these guys. Let's get all these fruits. Out came out the cults. You hear them all over online. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. A lot of cults claim that. They claim to be Christians. You got the Mormons by Brigham Young, sprouted in Utah. Jehovah Witnesses by Charles Russell, sprouted in New York. Christian Science by Mary Baker Eddy. Seventh-day Adventism by Ellen G. White. The Church of Christ by Alexander Campbell, sprouted all over the South. Charismatics with their healings and speaking of tongues, sprouted in California and infested all Protestant denomination churches. Hyper-dispensationalists by Cornelius Stamm, sprouted in New Jersey ruining the doctrine of dispensationalism. Due to this mess of different Christians sprouting, what do you get? You get too many different Christians that you get the world to think, why can't we all just get along? And thus, the Jesuits and the Catholic Church successfully used it. And they successfully used it when the Pope opened up the ecumenical movement. And he would host all these events of all these uh, people, religious leaders and politics and government leaders to come and to meet together. Why? So that we can all come together, together, and finally be united. That's why Rabbi Zacharias didn't criticize the Catholic Church. 
That's why your modern Bible translations, oh, you didn't know this? The text, the Greek text they used to translate, they used two Jesuits to help them on that. You didn't know? Uh, they don't speak out against the Catholic Church. Why? Why did Billy Graham, Graham cave in? Jack Van Impe cave in and all these preachers. You know why? Because the Catholic Church has power now. They were aiming for Christian churches. But not just Christian churches. Now they were getting different worldwide religions. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and all the other religions. You see them meeting with the audience, with His Holiness, the Pope. And thus, we're getting closer and closer to a one world era. Significant now, churches fell. So, this is food for thought. You notice, with all this, Okay, so um, basically what you have to understand is this. If, if school here, science here, Bible here, government powers, and then you got uh, even uh, the whole world right here, your very own conscience right here, and churches... Nowhere is safe to find the truth, and where else are you going to find truth? Nowhere. Mm -hmm. The devil covered every single area where the Lord can minister to you so that he can poison the truth. It's now nothing, everything has been covered. It's nothing now but a government-controlled, Hollywood and school-brainwashed world mm -hmm. under a Catholic banner. Satan won. Mm -hmm. We're not far away from the new world order. He won. That's how he got the victory. Now you know why we fell? One by one. Underground. Where you least expect it. Where you don't really see. Where you don't really know. The Lord decided, this is it. I'm going to raise out now the last days. He sent in his revival champions for the last days. Here they are. Who are they? Who are these people? First, he's got to get his book back. Mm -hmm. So then Westcott and Hoare, while they were spewing out their garbage, a famous scholar contemporary to Westcott and Hoare, his name is Dean Bergen, he came to the scene, and then uh, he criticized heavily Westcott and Hoare. Then a person who was educated from the Ivy League schools, his name is Edward F. Hills. And Hills was the one who had this education background and experience with Harvard Princeton who wrote a book in a scholarly manuscript evidence way defending the King James Bible. These were the two men defending the King James Bible and the manuscript evidence that the King James Bible came from. So the Bible now was defended. But there's another one now. Another one had to be doctrine. So then... Doctrine was so messed up all over, you have to give right teaching. What's wrong about this, right? What's wrong about this? What's wrong about this? What's wrong about this? You have to know doctrine. So then the number one doctrine, which was most important, was dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, Amen. nearly 90% of heresies you hear today from all these other churches that I mentioned is because they failed to rightly divide the Bible. Right. Dispensationalism was championed. C.I. Schofield came to the scene. He was a lawyer who wrote the Schofield Reference Bible. And then he wrote this Schofield Reference Bible that spread to thousands about dispensationalism. Clarence Larkin was the next one. He was an engineering graduate who was a Baptist pastor. And he drew scores of charts that created in the number one dispensational book you'll ever get. All right? Which every, I recommend everyone to buy. It's called... Uh, where is it right here? Okay. So it's called... The, great, uh, the, greatest truth, uh, the greatest book on dispensational truth. Dispensational truth. Why? Because truth needs to march on. This doctrine was necessary to defend against the cults, the humanistic philosophers, and Christian modernist scholars who kept finding contradictions in your Bible when those weren't contradictions. They were just divided for the different group of people, different right. time period. Right. It was absolutely essential. Then, you know, you got, uh, the next one was the independent fundamental Baptist. The church's doctrine through dispensationalism was defended. The book was defended. Now you got to get your churches back. In came the independent fundamental Baptist churches. 
Norris was the guy who started the Independent Baptist. The other denominations, they decided to join in to defend the fundamentals of the faith. Thus, they became fundamentalists. R.A. Torrey, the, uh, the one who took over after D.L. Moody, wrote out volumes on fundamentals and got different denominations of old-time churches, uh, old-time Methodists and old-time Baptists, Congregationalists, etc., all together, and they became the fundamentalist preachers. Oh, that's where you get that news media brainwashing about fundamentalist Christian, huh? Yeah. About yeah. blowing people up. That's not your history. The history is because simply they want to defend the fundamentals of the faith. See, that's news media brainwashing, man. Gets me stinking angry against this wicked, evil news media. Amen. So now the fundamental Christian doctrines and churches were gathering together and churches were being defended. Fundamentalists risen out from R.A. Torrey's ashes. Buchant Vicks famous Baptist Bible Fellowship, which became the world's largest Baptist fundamentalist. Bob Jones Sr. started Bob Jones University. John R. Rice with his Sword of the Lord. Jack Hiles hit the top 15 largest churches. Lee Robertson with his Tennessee Temple Schools and University. And then Arlen and Becca Horton with their Abeka Academy to provide a Christian school finally away from the wicked secular uh, school system. However, the problem is this. The problem is the Lord, just like all these people, was laying out foundations, right? But it was not enough against all of this. It was not enough. Because why? Everyone was doing their separate thing now. See, these guys were concentrating KJV and Schofield Larkin with dispensationalism. These guys just on their church on the fundamentals. You need to combine all three, and not just combine all three, you need to expand it. And you need to expand it with more doctrine. In came the infamous Peter S. Ruckman. Yeah, Peter man. S. Ruckman was just as, he's an important man in history. Why? Just like without Norse, you wouldn't get the movement. Luther, you wouldn't get the breaking off, and then a lot of other people that were counted as important. Tyndale, you wouldn't get the Bible, and etc. This man was definitely important. If it wasn't for this man, then you wouldn't get your Bible-believing churches today. He was born from the independent fundamental Baptist churches. He graduated. Uh, he was a hopeless drunk who wanted to commit suicide. But Hugh F. Pyle, who was a fundamentalist pastor, halted him and led him to Christ. Ruckman was so wicked back then that he would cuss every sentence. So then when he, was pra when he prayed to get saved... He was cussing in between while he was praying to get saved. And then Hugh F. Pyle just smiled at him and said, You meant every word? And then Ruckman said, You better blankety blank blank right, I believed every word. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, it took time where he cleaned off, right? So he changed his dressing and everything. Hugh F. Pyle said he looked 20 years younger after he got saved. He, he changed everything, clean cut. He wanted something clean. He wanted something clean, so he wanted to go to Bob Jones University. He went to, uh, he, Bob Jones Sr. Uh, said that this man is the most brilliant man in our campus. That's what Bob Jones Sr. said about uh, Peter S. Ruckman. Buchan Vick, also the world's largest, Buchan Vick, founder of the Baptist Bible Fellowship, world's largest Baptist fundamentalist. He said that he is, Dr. Ruckman is the greatest Bible teacher in America. He used to be praised for answering the Bible within less than 45 seconds as John R. Rice advertised Dr. Upman's evangelism work. This man will answer your question 45 seconds or less. But what happened? What happened was, see, the problem is these independent fundamental Baptists, they weren't grounded on doctrine. And not only that, they were poisoned by some of this system here. They didn't, some, a lot of them didn't believe the King James Bible was perfect, even though they defended it. Because there was some of this that was ingrained. Some of this that was ingrained, actually. And they weren't really successful against the cults. Why? Because they weren't grounded so much in this. They weren't so grounded so much in doctrine. Peter S. Ruckman, he was the spoiled child that the Lord used to, to get the blessing of all three. And all of you today are even the more spoiled bunch. Amen. Because uh, what we get with our Bible-believing truth is not all from yours truly. It's something that comes from a history of 2,000 plus years. Thank you, Lord. You have to Amen. understand. Thank you. Foundation after foundation. 
Rotman opened the doors where we were able to combine all three. Because of this, he expanded, he combined all three, and not only that, he expanded it further, and the people who were influenced by him expanded it even way further than that. Uh, Doc, Dr. Rotman was undoubtedly the champion that was used by the Lord during the golden days of fundamentalism that time, during the 90s, from the 60s to the 90s. Uh, in a debate where he was uh, going against the famous Catholic apologist, Carl Keating, who still is considered one of their famous Catholic apologists today, he's a lawyer, when he debated successfully against him, the priests were so much in shock by how Ruckman was quoting out these documentations of Catholic heresies that they all lined up in front of Carl Keating, Carl Keating and asked him, is that true? Is that true? What he said, is that true? Earl Callan, he's the founder, uh, he's one of the founders of the best Bible version committee that was the fruits of West Coven Horn, the NIV, NIE. Dr. Ruckman wanted that guy. But guess what? It was, it was not even a debate. <laughs> It was so horrendous that Earl Callan just basically em embarrassed himself, completely humiliated that Bible believers even felt sorry for Earl Callan. But that's how the Lord mightily used him. In a debate against a Muslim who thought his Quran was unchangeable, Dr. Ruckman pulled out several different Qurans and Muslim scholars that would contradict the same Quran that the Muslim was using. In a debate against a biology evolution professor, Professor had no argument against Dr. Ruckman, but just to say with the, in front of the news media, Ruckman was just misquoting sources. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Ruckman said, all he said was, I gave you page number, just look at it and see if I'm misquoting. Page number and look if I'm misquoting the source. In fact, one time, uh, he one time took his PBI students up to a university and in class, they, the, the secular college students would not let Ruckman go for four hours as they bombed him with question after question after question. And Ruckman just kept answering everything within four hours. The, the class did not want to let him go, so he was forced out of class after that. There was no doubt the Lord mightily used him. He created tons of books, articles, and videos that filled out more than seven shelves. One critic who is such a diehard fan of Ruckman that he hates him so much to the core actually said this about Ruckman. Quote, one thing about Ruckman is that he's not a lazy man. Because <laughs> this guy dug up every material from Ruckman to critique him. The evidence is very simple to see his fruit. Just go to his bookstore. Go to his bookstore and look at the works if, if what I'm telling you is not true that he armed up everything on this. Look at his uh, graduates who became pastors. The, the fellow apostate Christians who got messed up by this counter-reformation and modernism of that time, guess what they did? Just like uh, all the enemies of the devil they did that time. What did they, did, what did they do to Wycliffe's followers? You're called a lawler. Hussites. You follow a man. You're a Hussite. With Wesley, you follow a man, you're a Wesleyan. With uh, uh, Waldensians, you follow a man, Peter Waldo. No, they go further back to Vaudois, second century. Thus, they did the same tactic that did not change ever since 2,000 years of, years of history. The enemies, the enemies of Christianity, the enemies sent from the devil, they did the same thing to the people influenced by him. They called us Rachmanites. Mm -hmm. But we like to call ourselves Bible believers. Amen. Amen. But be that as it may, as Luther's followers were called Lutherans, and Huss's followers called Hussites, I'm not ashamed to be called a Ruckmanite. Amen. I am glad to be following my ancestors, what they went through back then. Yeah. To be called out by the enemies of the Lord, by the, devil's en uh, by the enemies sent from the devil, I'm proud to be called out by them. I'm proud to be called out by them. Because I'm just following a pattern that repeated for 2,000 years. Thus came the fruit. Last days, the Lord raised up today's preachers, today's champions. And here they stood. In the last days of Laodicea, in this hellish apostasy, the preachers made their last stand. William Grady, he was a professor of 
the largest fundamentalist university of his time, Jack Hiles University. But he used to critique that he didn't believe the King James Bible was perfect. One person gave him Dr. Ruckman's book about the King James Bible. William Grady read it and then got converted. And then what happened is he defended the King James Bible and in front of Clarence Sexton's Crown University, he defended the King James Bible for more than one hour, called out Ruckman, and then embarrassed the entire fundamentalist crowd and preachers of that time. Because he was unashamed. Jack Chick, he wrote the famous comic Chick Tracks. Amen. Uh, he was in touch with Ruckman, and he would do phone calls at the beginning with him, asking him for theological questions to make sure that his tracks would come out doctrinally sound at the beginning. Jack Chick had a humble beginning. All he did was he just used his kitchen to create his first comic track. The Lord turned it where he became the world's most published author, as mentioned by the Smithsonian Institute. Reasonable. Millions passed out. His writings, were so controver his writings were so spread out that the Vatican had his number, and they banned his writings for exposing the secrets of the Jesuits at that time. You got Sam Gibb, who came out with the doctrine from Dr. Ruckman's school, and he attacked the Greek and the academia world with just a very simple booklet called the Answer Book, yeah. done in a manner that is so simple that any layman, as Tyndale mentioned, my goal is to make sure that a simple layman would know more of the scriptures than some kind of religious intellectual. Mm -hmm. The dream came to pass because of the fruits of what the Lord was opening up through Ruckman. Sam Gibb laid it out with his defense of the King James Bible. David Peacock came out, and he became very close friends of Dr. Ruckman. He used to be the captain of the police force, but uh, he became the preacher that became a very dramatic preacher, one of the best illustrative preachers that you'll ever find on this earth. One time when he was preaching, he was preaching about casting crowns at Jesus' feet, and the people would just be so moved and drawn as if it was George Whitfield preaching. They would take off their shoes and cast their shoes down on the altar's floor as if they were casting crowns at Jesus' Amen. feet that time. Bill Eubanks, he graduated, he attended Ruckman School, but what happened was he had a burden for lost people. And what he did was, I'm going to fly over the Vatican. And he flew over the Vatican and dropped down 10,000 tracks yeah, all over their famous festival days at the Vatican. Well, he can't go back over there anymore. And then, uh, now this is just rumor. Rumor was, after that, he was so pumped up, he was going to go over Mecca. And then his fellow brethren in Christ said, no, don't do it, brother. <laughs> the Lord mightily used him that time. Greg Eastip was also influenced by the Bible-believing doctrines. And then Ruckman's people were close friends with him. Uh, Peacock uh, had uh, education and re uh, reception and dealings with Greg Eastip. He started his own institute and school. And then he started to combat with another doctrinal school. One of the people that came out who was influenced by Eastip and Ruckman and other Bible believers, a man who was part of a... a a uh, notorious uh, biker gang, yeah. and this man even broke uh, a man in half, and he ended up in prison. He was going to be doomed over there, probably for life. For all the crimes that he committed, he did it. But then there was a person uh, where he was able to hear the gospel, and then someone gave him the gospel, and his name is David Spurgeon. He yeah. got saved by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he went in front of the court, uh, in front of the jury, the judge looked at him and he said, well, you know, you definitely look like a changed man. You know, I think that the Lord did something to change your life. So guess what? He went off free and he became an evangelist. Yep. A man is covered with tattoos from all over from his wicked days. And you would see him wearing a full suit. Why? Because I'm a new man this time. Yep. I'm not my old ways Praise anymore. The, the man who gave William Grady the book about, the, about rough men and changed his life was a man named Jack Patterson, and he started out uh, homes for children, and he had a burden for children. And even Fox News and the news media would try to catch him on something. But then Jack Patterson, he just soldiered on, and he just kept preaching the gospel, ministering to broken children. And you would see these broken children who were once bound by rebel uh, rebellious background, drug background, poverty background, all of a sudden... They come out in front of the church quoting verses and chapters of the Bible and singing hymns in front of your eyes. That's how the Lord mightily used him. Jimmy Hood started rescue missions for those people, for the grown adult men 
who were drunk and broken, bound by addiction. And how he got them was through, he got his drunken boys involved in street preaching. Yeah. And these rescue mission boys, they would come out, and these men, they would preach the gospel out on the streets with him, and they would invite people over to the rescue mission and get them to attend church and get them saved. Amen. The Lord was using Bible believers one by one. David Walker graduated from Dr. Upman's school, wrote the best Bible-believing book on dispensationalism, and it's called The Bible Believer's uh, Guide to Dispensationalism. Now it's called Rightly Dividing the Bible. He's got two more volumes to come out. There was another preacher God used, Vince Massa. He came from the famous Tom Malone School. That was IFB. But just like many of those people at that time, they were drawn to the poison of what Ruckman was preaching and teaching. One time Malone would sneak out of his, uh, uh, out of his IFB schools just to sneak out and to hear Dr. Ruckman preach and teach at uh, another church nearby. Vince Massa, his preaching style was, he would go, he's a preacher in Connecticut. When he preaches, he would put his leg over the pulpit, bark down at you with his finger pointed down, and yell and scream when he preaches. Amen. I mean, uh, that was his preaching style. One time, uh, it was said that uh, when James Lentz went up to preach, the famous James Lentz, I'll tell you about him, he's a character. When he came up to preach, then it was, uh, he preached an excellent sermon, so it was said through rumors that Vince Massa, when it was his turn, guess what, he's got to amp it up. So he uh, pounded the pulpit so hard that he yeah. broke the pulpit when he yeah. was preaching. <laughs> Amen. Now let me tell you about these other people. God used uh, uh, Wilson Calvin. He's a Native American, and he was ministering to the Native Americans in Arizona. And uh, he was a preacher, pastor of church, influenced because he saw one time one of his friends having a colorful set of commentaries, and he said, what is this? And he read it and got introduced to Dr. Ruffman, the man himself. Wilson Calvin, uh, one time when he was preaching, he had a confrontation with an atheist. And that atheist said, there is no God. And the Wilson Calvin says, there is no God? You're really sure? And then Calvin dropped on his knees, kind of a little bit like Mordecai I am. But Wilson Calvin said, Lord God, I pray that you'll drop this man dead right here. And then that atheist said, you can't <laughs> and then Wilson Calvin said, gotcha, you believe in a God. <laughs> and then the Lord raised up a woman to shake up the, the male scholars who were already acting up like a bunch of sissified women anyway. So the Lord had to have a woman to teach these men a lesson. And the Lord raised up Gail Ripplinger, who Praise wrote her famous New Age Bible versions. And then in the first edition of... Her preface was actually written by Dr. Ruckman, believe it or not, in her first edition of the preface. But because that name was such a poisonous name, in her later editions, Ruckman persuaded her to drop it. What happened was she kicked every male, God used a woman to kick every male leader of the NASV, NIV, NKJV, and other modern Bible version committees. The leaders were enraged by her book, and they accused her heavily for being, uh, for misquotation. But even though you can, even though even if you find a few misquotations here and there, the, po the point is she put hundreds of quotations there. You can't deny the 90% of the evidence in there. The Lord mightily used her. The Lord also used a wild man named James Lentz. He was a le golden legend, a favorite of preachers among the Bible-believing preachers. He was actually my favorite preacher, believe it or not. Amen. Graduated from Ruckman School. He was called a heretic by North Carolina churches. Why? Because he just kept giving them a hard time, all right? Just exposed them to their apostasy. One time when he was street preaching, the sheriff went up to him and told him that he should stop. And the sheriff said, what is your name? And, uh, what, what church are you from? And he said, and Lynn said, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. And the sheriff said, don't get smart with me. That's not what I'm asking you. The sheriff said, where are you from, you know? And then uh, Lentz, uh, he said, I'm going to have to, uh, you got to stop your preaching. And Lentz said, I can't stop preaching. And then the sheriff, the next time he visited Lentz, he begged him and he said, could you just please stop your preaching? Because I got my commander in chief, you know, barking on my neck and it's so hard for me. Could you please stop preaching for that? And Lentz says, I'm so sorry, sir. I got a commander in chief. Amen. 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 That's why I couldn't stop. So I That's can't stop right. preaching. The sheriff went off, 
Then the state had to send their hired preacher to James Lentz to try to persuade him to stop preaching. And that state hired preacher said, you know, I was young, zealous, just like you back then. But this doesn't work. And Lentz says, it doesn't work. And then the, the state's hired preacher said, no, it doesn't work. And then Lentz, he looked over and he saw one of his boys leading a black person to salvation. And this black person was crying and saying, Lord Jesus, save me, save me, save me. And when Lentz saw that, he got mad at that state's hired preacher. And he said, let me tell you something, Grandpa. It really works. Yeah. It really works. You better get out of here before I beat the fire out of you. Hey, and then that hey. state hired preacher backed off and got scared. He said, I knew you got devils. I knew you got devils. <laughs> And Lentz replied back, you're right, I got devils. You better get away before I give you some. <laughs> wild man. The Lord raised up another wild man. Alan Ryman graduated from Dr. Upman's school as well. Pastored over 100 members in, the, uh, in Catholic Delaware. But the Lord mildly used him where this preacher, you know, when he was preaching out on the streets... You know, all the Catholics were ignoring him, rejecting him. So then what he did was he dressed up like a priest. And when he dressed up like a priest, he was preaching and then ministering to the people. And all these people were going, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And they were receiving the gospel, receiving the chick trap. And then one of the police officers drove by and <laughs> to Alan Ryman. And he says, are you, uh, are you sure you're really a priest? What are you doing here? And then Ryman said, What's your badge and serial number, my child? And then the police officer went, ah, and ran out. <laughs> then one of these other people who was mocking Ryman and the other street preaching threw something at Ryman. And then what happened was the police officers, they actually chased down that guy and arrest, and then they stopped him and arrested him. And Ryman, he said, yeah, that's right. He must be a Baptist. Arrest him. Arrest him. <laughs> Lord Miley used him where he would have uh, 200, if not maybe 300 or more people now in his church. God mightily used Gerald Sutek, who also graduated from Rutland School. He started a street preaching ministry. It's called SWAT Team for Christ. Yep. Now he's a missionary to the Philippines. Catholic Fox News were criticizing his team about, oh, burning in hell forever. But his men preached. In fact, in the Philippines... He even mentioned that with Islam spreading over there, that Sutek, that his preacher boys, they would preach and they would be careful. But they would even, some, he would even, sometimes some of these boys would even preach. I mean, we go along with the Muslims over there. I mean, uh, we make sure our testimony is good. We even have one of our preachers freely saying, you know, Jesus died for you. Muhammad didn't die for you. Jesus loved you. Muhammad didn't love you. But I'll tell you what Muhammad would love. He would love your family member here and this person right here and your wife and all that stuff. And they just went out bashing Muhammad. But uh, the Lord mightily used his street reach and ministry to reach so many fruits in the Philippines as well as around the world. By the way, I don't know if you knew this, uh, whenever he had the SWAT team meeting street preaching back then, he used to have it here in Northern California, the street preaching blitz. You know what was their theme song? All hail Emmanuel. The Lord has a sense of humor 10, 15, 20 years later. Amen. Lord Miley was spreading out fruits. You got Rick Sowell who graduated from Rutland School, pastored 500 to 800, if not 1,000 members. Rick DeMichael, who graduated from Rutland School, pastored 1,000 to somewhere between 2,000 members. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was just spreading mightily throughout every land. Bible believers spreading out in the last days. Mm -hmm. Joseph Anderson in Papua New Guinea. You got Daniel Bardwell in Ukraine. You got Chad Burnick in Alaska. Jeffrey Brigham in Japan. John Byer to Canada. Tyler Campbell to Scotland. Mm -hmm. Thomas Castellaw to Germany. Michael Cecil in Thailand. Paul Sosilchik, who's a medical missionary. Aaron Klippinger to the... Chinese people in Canada, uh, Gabriel Cochran, Montreal, Quebec, uh, Robert Christ to the Philippines, Joel Dare to Brazil, Perry Demopoulos, Ukraine, Steve Dickens to England, Mark Dunlap, Dunlap to Mozambique, Craig Fitzgerald to Mongolia, Michael Flick to Malawi, Leonard Fogel to Israel, Joel Hauser to Germany, Rud uh, Rudiger Hemmer to Germany, Jason Hines to Quebec City, Earl Howell to Honduras, Raymond Jones to Mexico, Edward Keogh to Ukraine, Daniel Levita to Honduras, Joshua Lee to Sicily, David Leather to the Philippines, Dean Mazzaferi in Italy, Eric Michael in Republic of Georgia, Jason Moore to Fiji, 
Kenneth Murphy to Germany, Marco Perez to Colombia, Chris Rosmondo to Malawi, David Robinson to Malawi, Philip Robinson to Chile, Matthew Schiraus in Brazil, Nicholas Verhoff in Switzerland, Roger Vernos to Philippines, Kenneth West to Ukraine, Richard Wiles to Ukraine, Josh Deselchik to the Amazon, Michael Huggins to Brazil, Derek Hansen to the Magdalene's region, Vince LaRue to Chile, and hundreds if not thousands of more Bible believers. Amen. The virus has spread. And I'm talking about the Bible believing virus. This is our champions today. And we've been spreading out since. And that's, the, that's your champions. Those are your heroes today that we support, that we pray for, that we come to church together. Why? Because we're the last Stand against this wicked, evil system. Amen. And nowadays we're in Christians who are falling out. And we cannot get more Christians falling out. With Bible believers spreading out more and more and more, you finally have one who was finally influenced by Ruckman's writing. And he had a burden. He lived in New Hampshire. And then he was influenced by the IFB crowd. But once he read Ruckman's book, his life changed. And he had a burden to start a church in the Los Angeles County. He received death threats through the phone calls, had churches attempting to ban him from the newspapers and the web, but he kept marching on, and he pastored a church, and he's been there now for almost 20 years. He had a son who, his, who him and his wife prayed, Lord, we surrender him to you. I pray that you'll do something great with his life. The son came to graduate from the University of California at Berkeley, and started a church from scratch here in the San Jose area, and thus we come to San Jose Bible Baptist Church in the San Francisco Bay Area. Praise the Lord. Our history is so rich. Wow. It's so important. You don't you have no idea what church you've fallen into. Amen. I want to encourage onlineers, go to your Bible believing church. Amen. All right. Let's go to war church. Yeah. Heavenly Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray today's uh, lesson has encouraged the people, made us uh, be more dedicated, on fired up to bring lost souls to thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.